A recovering lawyer like you. Yeah. audience is here, but by the way, you can't see anybody, right? There's people out there. There's people out there. All right. Well, well uh, have my notes, but I don't have it. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, we're very excited uh, to be here today um, to present uh, Tech Titans of National Security, the West Coast Edition. This is the second in a series of events uh, that uh, George Mason University's Anton Scalia Law School, the National Security Institute there, has co-hosted with the Federal Society and the Hoover Institution. Our first event was a few months back in Washington, D.C., and this is our first event out here on the West Coast, so we're very excited to have uh, this audience here, and we're very grateful to um, our, our colleagues, uh, both at, uh, at the Federal Society and at the Hoover Institution, for giving us the space um, and for giving us these great panelists. So um, with that, let me uh, introduce our panelists and introduce a bit of our topic um, and then go through a little bit of discussion. I think the way we're going to have this uh, go in terms of format is that I'll ask some questions of our esteemed panelists. Uh, we'll have a little bit of uh, hopefully uh, entertaining debate amongst us about the topics we're talking about. And then we'll turn it over to you for questions from the audience. We'll have some microphones that'll be circulating around um, and we'll go from there if, that are, if that's all right with folks. So with that, um, let me good. introduce myself. I am Jamil Jaffer. I'm the founder of the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Anton Scalia Law School. Um, I'm a recovering lawyer. Um, I previously served uh, in the Bush administration in a couple of jobs. Uh, and then on Capitol Hill. Uh, and I now uh, work at a cybersecurity company known as IronNet Cybersecurity, uh, which is run by the former director of the National Security Agency and the founding commander of U.S. Cyber Command, General Keith Alexander. Uh, to my immediate right is Jacob Crisp. Jacob is the director for cybersecurity at Microsoft. Uh, he's a board member of the National Cybersecurity Alliance. He's a cyber fellow at the Center for Strategic International Studies and the former deputy staff director at the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And at one time, also was a presenter of the President's Daily Brief. Is that Thanks. correct? All right. Um, Jacob is a graduate of Georgetown Law School, but I guess in some sense is also a recovering lawyer, so we've got a lot of those on the panel. Um, Katie Musaris, immediately to uh, Jacob's immediate right, is the founder of Luda Security, founder and CEO of Luda Security. She was directly involved in DOD's first bug bounty program for hackers, founded Microsoft's vulnerability research program, and was a senior security strategy, strategist at Microsoft. She also currently serves as a visiting scholar at MIT's Sloan School of Business as an affiliate of the Harvard Kennedy School. Immediately to Katie's right is Mark Ryland. Mark is a, is, <clears throat> is, was once the chief architect for Amazon's worldwide public sector service and is now a director in the office of the chief information security so, uh, officer at Amazon. Uh, Mark is also a recovering lawyer. Uh, had his, got his BA at University of San Diego and his law degree at Berkeley. Um, and also clerked on the Fifth Circuit for Judge Gibbs. Is that correct? Yes. And then finally, last but certainly not least, is uh, a nearly 20-year uh, senior fellow, uh, the Bedford Senior Fellow here at the Hoover Institution, and my former professor in law school at the University of Chicago, Richard Epstein. Uh, professor Epstein goes almost without introduction. He has written over a dozen books on topics ranging from antitrust uh, to technology, uh, he got his BA at Columbia University, uh, LLB at Yale, and is a graduate of Oxford, um, and is, remains, even today, while he is the Tisch professor at NYU Law School, remains the James Hall Distinguished Service Professor at my alma mater, the University of Chicago. So 
Uh, with that, an extremely distinguished panel, probably too many lawyers for a really serious conversation about cybersecurity, but we'll try and fake it to make it. Um, and, and Katie will keep us real um, when we get it wrong. So I have never been a lawyer, so that's... <laughs> And never hope to be one, I hope. <laughs> you never know. There you go. I can't remember being a lawyer, so. <laughs> Even better. I'm, so, uh, I've never, so, I'm still an addict. <laughs> I thought what we'd do is sort of talk uh, in, in sort of general terms about national level cybersecurity. And when I say national level cybersecurity, what I'm thinking of, or at least what's in my head, and I'd love the panel's thoughts on whether I've got this right, is the kind of threats that, that, uh, that, we, uh, that we need to address at the national level, the federal government level, but also at the large corporation level. So threats from countries like China, which is in a constant effort to steal our intellectual property and reuse it abroad for economic purposes. Countries like Russia that are engaged in ongoing efforts to influence our political system. Whether you believe they influence the elections or not, there can be no question today that Russia is engaged in an active effort to undermine American confidence in our own electoral systems. Countries like North Korea and Iran, who have both conducted actually destructive cyber attacks in the United States going back almost half a decade. So there are nations around the world that are coming after the United States, but it's not just nations. There are large-scale criminal groups operating out of various parts of the world, including Eastern Europe and Russia, uh, that operate with impunity around the world to steal resources um, and, to, and to create economic challenges for consumers and businesses alike. And then, of course, we have those uh, non-nation state actors, asymmetric groups that look at cyber as an opportunity to take advantage of vulnerabilities that larger nation states have where they might be able to present an asymmetric threat. So we have a range of threats. And I think what, what I'd love to talk to, to, to Jacob and to Katie and, and Mark and Professor Epstein about is how do companies and governments and individuals think about these national cyber level problems and how do they address them? So in particular, Jake, starting with you, um, you now, you're not Microsoft. You saw the threat from the government side when you were a PDB briefer, when you're at the House Intelligence Committee, you're now in a large corporate entity, an entity that uh, you know sells millions of pieces of software worldwide. Um, it's on almost everybody's computer. Um, you're also providing a huge uh, cloud service presence uh, to corporate America uh, and, and, and frankly, frankly, globally. How do you guys think about national level cybersecurity or international level cybersecurity? How do you think about it in your products? And how do you think about it when it comes to working with partner companies in the government? Thanks. Let me start with saying thanks. Thanks for the panel for being here and for our hosts. Um, but yes, it's a great question. And so uh, let me outline a couple of things. I'll dig into it. I'd, I'd start with um, maybe a contrast in my experience in government and then talk about that transition. I mean, when you were in government, we were primarily focused on attribution and really the key groups and the key motivations behind those actors at the nation state level. And so when I was had my career um, previously in the intel community, that was really the intelligence gathering and the presentation of policymakers is figuring out who and why folks are making decisions. My transition to corporate America, um, really the conversation, you'll, you'll hear our CEO talk a lot about this, Satya Nadella, about trust. It's about obsession with customers and building and providing trust to the ecosystem. We're more focused on not necessarily the motivations of actors, but really just detecting and, and defending and preventing attacks on all of our customers. And so I raise that because as all of you know, I'll state the obvious, we're in a pretty hyper-connected world. And so as we transition as a corporation and as an ecosystem stakeholder um, into that hyper-connected world, we're constantly figuring out how to deal with new devices, new applications, data, et cetera, and how do we incorporate that into our protection regime and how do we be a better and responsible actor in the ecosystem. And so as I move through that, you know, I would say one trend that, that I've really um, paid a lot more attention to because primarily Microsoft is known as an enterprise company, but of course we have individual um, support and lots of work with um, consumers and customers is the boards across you know, all of the sectors I'd say in the U.S. but globally are starting to really get educated and aware that this cybersecurity, this issue matters to them. And so you know, I can cite some statistics that all of my colleagues here really know a lot about, but I'll just throw a couple of those out. You know that really most of the breaches these days, um, I mean, it's costing upwards of four million dollars per breach. In the U.S., it's even more. It's upwards of $17 million. And I think the statistics, and Katie will probably know this better than I do more recently, it can even grow higher, right? You've had huge increases in attacks on the ransomware side. We see new families across ransomware as of 2016 increase by about 750%. So these are new evolving more, uh, and evolving threats that we're having to deal with. And then lastly, I'll say the, the detection and intrusion piece of this that boards are aware of 
you know, is it takes anywhere from 90 to 100 days once an actor's on your network to figure out someone's there and then respond. And that's a huge business cost potentially for some of these big companies, not just internally, but across their customer base, right? So they're, the boards are starting to really focus on dealing with this as a risk management issue, but being proactive. And I'd say that's a new trend and something we get a lot of questions about architecting solutions to deal with that. So that's one of the reasons that's driving us uh, to be, again, you know, a responsible and better stakeholder as we bake in our security conversations into every customer engagement. So that's one thing we're seeing a lot more of. Um, and then transitioning from there, we're talking about the bad guys. They're getting better, faster, better resource. It's not just nascent states that cyber criminals are. And so that requires us to take advantage at Microsoft across all of the security pieces that we see every day. So for us, you know, that means touching into our billions of endpoints across the world globally, and then really architecting a platform that ties in things like cloud, as, as Jamil mentioned. It ties in um, the whole AI family, and it ties in all the other pieces that we're doing so we can then infer from that um, smart decisions and talk to the customers a lot about what next steps they need to do, but more importantly, react and respond to attacks. Um, so let me say a couple more things about Microsoft specifically and what we're doing. We have a couple of core teams um, that work on security for us. You know, we have a bunch of response centers. We have a, um, uh, a Windows Defenders. You know, we have a unique process because we have products and services we can bake into the security discussion, but we also have defenders internally that can do that. And so we use all of that information on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and we try to work through the next steps on security and make sure we're relevant um, for our partners. So let me talk one last thing on the partners um, that Jamil touched on with government, and I will say something that is worth mentioning to all of you, and then I'll kick it over to Katie for her, her views on this. But um, one of the unique things about Microsoft that we've stood up is an actual enforcement and disruption mechanism inside Microsoft that's very, very unique to the ecosystem. It's called the Digital Crimes Unit. So we actually work aggressively with law enforcement across the world when we see things like fake domains, when we see intellectual property theft, when we see um, you know, folks internationally trying to, um, to impair or impede Microsoft customers. And we work with law enforcement, we work with um, the court system to go out and either um, try to establish protective orders, get them to try to take down fake domains and push them into sinkholes. More importantly, we work with law enforcement to actually take down bad actors off of, um, off of some of the boxes they're on. And so I think that's unique to Microsoft and something we focused a lot on. But with that, I'll defer over and I can come back for bigger picture stuff. So Katie, um, you know, you've heard uh, Jake talk about how Microsoft thinks about this challenge and some of the things they do with their partners and with the government. Are we thinking about this threat the right way? If I describe the threat accurately, if I miss things, you, you spend a lot of time focused on vulnerabilities and talking to your clients, both in the government and industry, about how they should think about vulnerabilities, how to disclose those. Um, are we thinking about the threat the right way? Well, I mean, I think there's, there's a, certainly always room for improvement in the vulnerability handling space, and that's obviously what my company does with, uh, you know, with a lot of these organizations. But I kind of want to take us back to the mid to late 90s when I used to work in a university on security. Um, I was a systems administrator when I was transitioning careers. Um, I spent the first four years of my career uh, working at MIT, and I was originally a molecular biologist working on the Human Genome Project. So fast forward, when I was trying to transition into something more directly computing related, um, I was a systems administrator. And uh, I took a job as a systems administrator for the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT. And MIT's network uh, in the early days, and only up until very recently, did not allow firewalls. Very recently did they allow firewalls. And the reason for this is because the internet, as we should know, in a university setting, was built on rock and roll and silly string. And it was not meant to support all of the functions that it has today. Um, but at that time, since it was forbidden for me as a systems administrator, tasked with protecting not just the networks, but actually the fundamental research that was going on in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So we were still, you know, we were putting Mars rovers out, but this was rocket science, right? This were, you know, th this is the stuff that goes into your next uh, stealth aircraft, your next missiles, um, satellite controls and launches. Uh, at that time, I remember being shocked that we were communicating with our satellites over Telnet. So back then, <laughs> And I'm sure still some of them, right? But back then, as you know, in the university context, guarding early intellectual property and advancements in science was absolutely my job. And I had to do it with pretty much one chopstick. You know what I mean? I, re I really didn't have the tools available to me as a systems administrator in that context. And I think we still see this problem today all the way from the roots of research. So when we think about it in terms of you know, our presence here in a university and how that translates into um, direct applications in industry, 
and then obviously in government uses and military uses, we need to kind of track back to the source of a lot of these pieces of information. And quite frankly, when I was in that position, having to you know, basically rig up my own intrusion detection and do my own policing of a network that was not really designed to be policed at all, nor by policy was it allowed to be heavily controlled, um, I found myself in a position that most organizations continue to find themselves in, whether or not they're in an academic setting or in private industry. Um, so I think of it as a there's a root cause problem, and that does not start with the industry's response. It actually starts much earlier in a lot of academic research environments. Um, when we you know, transition over into what the industry has done, you know, one of the most elucidating periods of my career was the seven years that I spent at Microsoft. Um, and I got a lot of empathy for, you know, real world problems. I remember one of the most transformative conversations I had was with one of the major customers, and they were uh, basically an industrial corporation, um, certainly a huge contributor to the United States uh, GDP. And they said, you know, their CISO gave a presentation to us in the Microsoft Security Response Center saying, you know what, on our corporate network, we've got automatic updates, you know, rolling out and everything. So enterprise-wise, we're feeling pretty good, and we feel good about the steps you've taken, you know, to, to secure your software. Um, but our smelting device, our, our big industrial machine, has a controller that is running Windows XP, and we will never patch that. And that was amortized you know, in our investment strategy for that machine for 50 years. So guess what? XP is running on that thing for 50 years. And so, and they're like, don't worry, it's air gapped. I'm glad somebody laughed. Yes, that is a laughable, you know, that's a laughable security control, quite honestly, right? It's mythological. Um, but the, you know, the main thing there was that what I learned was that you can, build a, you can build much more robust systems in an industrial setting and in a software and hardware manufacturing setting. But if your organizations that have deployed it either have no desire or no skill set available or really it would be too big of a risk to their underlying business, they will never apply those security controls. And so the overall ecosystem as it looks right now is basically a supply chain security nightmare. You know, and we've we've got to we've got to understand this beast for what it really is. All of us are unwitting and sometimes deliberate members of a supply chain, security supply chain. How many of you guys delay the patches? You know, on your machine, saying update me later, reboot my phone later. You know, and everything. You're that last mile. You know, or or last kilometer, depending on where you are. But you are that last, you know, uh, holder of the baton in the relay race to security. And uh, I think if we look at it holistically, from the research end of things to the application of technology to the, uh, you know, building better architected systems, but that last mile of deployment, I think that is a place where we still have considerable gaps, no easy address solution in sight, and if we bring it back to vulnerability management and vulnerability uh, reporting and response, 94% of the global 2000, Forbes Global 2000 companies have no public way to report a security vulnerability to them. These are companies that spend millions of dollars on cybersecurity uh, controls, on consultancies, on products, and yet they have this lacking ability to even take that input from the outside um, in a public way. And um, I, I'm going to go ahead and cede my time because I think we're only supposed to have two minutes. Hmm. But that, you know, from my perspective, that is, uh, we're looking at this from a view. Uh, way too close to the end point. And I think we need to track it back all the way to where the research starts and provide a lot more accessible tooling for especially the first mile, not just the last mile. So Mark, uh, it's funny when we put this panel together, I didn't realize that we have three Microsoft alums on the panel. Uh, Mark's also a Microsoft alum. <laughs> <I> worked, uh, <clears throat> what's that? You are not a Microsoft alum, or you have. I consulted with them. Well, there you go. Four Microsoft alums. Yeah. I'm the only one to not have been a Microsoft alum. I feel left out. <laughs> But Mark, I was going to ask you about how and, and whether you think whether your company, Amazon, which has, again, deployments around the world in everyone's homes, the Alexa device is spreading around the, around the globe, um, but then has this huge cloud footprint also that you helped architect. I was going to ask you about how you guys think about national cybersecurity, but actually, Katie made me think of a slightly different question, which is, so 
you know, Key described this, this challenge of trying to create, put security into a scenario where security wasn't thought about being built in. Amazon had a slightly different scenario, right? You be, began building this cloud, right, with security baked in, but then you very quickly, and particularly in the worldwide public sector, decided to go deploy this cloud for the CIA, C2S, where they decided to deploy TSSCI, top secret sensitive compartment information, onto a cloud network, sort of a, a game-changing moment for the government, um, and certainly a game-changing moment for Amazon. How do you guys think about that sort of national level cyber threat when it comes to that kind of a cloud architecture where you're securing literally the nation's most sensitive secrets um, in an environment that, you know, people might not be confident is secure? How do you get the CIA to trust you? I think the answer, the, the answer is, is complicated. So the, the, the first thing is a lot of the problems we're talking about are problems of legacy technology, things that are old, that have never been updated, are in principle non-updatable, like that microcontroller in that system. Um, and also systems that are very slow to change and have very low degrees of automation. So one of the huge problems we face in our industry, in addition to the fact that we, our end users still click on phishing links and all kinds of um, basic kind of hygiene issues, the difficulty of patching, the difficulty of updating, maintaining, but also software that lives for long periods of time. The whole notion of an advanced persistent threat means that something can live for a long time in an unchanging environment, right? It doesn't, you can't do a, an APT in a, in a fast moving secure DevOps in, environment where you update the code three times a day. It just APT? doesn't. APT? Advanced persistent threat? Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so part of what the, the game changer for the CIA was to go, first of all, go out to the industry and say, how are modern enterprises doing both very rapid, aggressive new uh, technology, um, modernizing, doing, uh, doing digital transformation and dealing with big data problems and massive new data sources, how are they doing that? And how are they doing it efficiently and at reasonable cost? And when they did an industry survey, they found, well, gosh, everybody who's on the cutting edge is using cloud technology. Um, now, obviously, we had to go through a very deep and elaborate process of building trust that our technology at its core was architected in a very, very safe and secure way. But in the end, by building essentially a copy of our normal cloud infrastructure, which we, you know, we uh, bust a, a, you know, our, our gut every day trying to make sure that it is the most secure platform that we can possibly build, we could stamp out a copy for them running on their secret network or attached to their secret network, um, and they could get access to the same technology that enterprises and startups have access to as well. So they made a strategic decision to go for cutting edge technology which enables high degrees of automation, enables rapid uh, development of both their application code, but also the infrastructure itself, constantly adding new features and new capabilities. Every six months, we deliver some great new security feature that would have taken them years to deploy in their traditional networks. So it's, it's a combination of being on the cutting edge, dealing with, with uh, big data problems in a very efficient way, wanting to get to for pay as you go. Like no, People are sick of investing massive amounts of capital in a systems that age indefinitely and are expensive to replace. People want to be able to do constant refresh pay for just what they're using and use the latest thing as it comes out. If Intel comes out with a brand new processor that's 30% faster and has some amazing new capability for doing um, you know, floating point or something that speeds up your... Uh, your, your, your machine learning model, or if NVIDIA's new chip comes out and it's five times faster than the old one, everybody's stuck with the capitalized equipment that they bought six months ago. In a cloud environment, you simply just, you know, essentially stop start. You like, or even in, in some cases, we have live update capabilities where you can literally just migrate running applications to run on the latest hardware. And it's our responsibility to age out the old stuff and maybe sell it at discounted prices to the people that don't want the cutting, cutting edge. So the, it's a massive change in the way IT is done generally. It also has these really powerful security benefits because we can take care of a whole lot of the problems that people used to really struggle with. And even the responsibility that customers maintain, and they still have to be responsible for the stuff they deploy on these new platforms, we try to make that really easy and really, really automatable. Now, this is generic across all the cloud vendors. I'm not saying anything that's unique to Amazon Web Services. Um, and that maybe ties back to the title of our panel, the tech titans, if you will. We have a very different business incentive and a bit different business model than, than sometimes the small players do. If you're small, let's take IoT. IoT is a great example. Five years ago, if I wanted to deploy a little smart, smart toaster, let's say, I would go out, I would download some open source, um, free RTOS operating system, I would um, you know, do kind of the absolute minimum to just get the thing out there and get some customers. I wouldn't worry about secure protocols. I wouldn't worry about encryption. It was too expensive and it was, it was, it was friction and it, was, it wasn't helping me to make that first dollar that I needed in my, in my toaster startup. If you go to, fast forward to today and you look at the, the ecosystems that Microsoft builds, that we build, that Google builds and others, 
the stuff you download to get started has security built in. Free RTOS, we've now taken over as an open source um, pr uh, project, and Free RTOS now does things like field updatability. You can re you can redeploy the entire operating system with over there updates, and we built that technology because you got to be able to do that in order to update these devices once they're deployed. But it wasn't built in before, and things like X519 certificate support, so I could do TLS connections over over the internet, that wasn't built in. All the things that are now built in, and the default. <laughs> is now a secure environment. And so if I'm a toaster maker, still taking the course of least resistance, because of these, these ecosystems that the large vendors are investing in massively, I get way better security, even if I do nothing, compared to what would have been just a few years ago. So there's some real benefits to getting businesses whose, whose, whose business interests align with maximal security to provide capabilities across these wide range of systems. Now, Professor Epstein, you've, you've certainly now heard from two big tech companies. You've heard from Katie about the threat and the vulnerability disclosure process and the like. Uh, you think a lot about efficiency in systems and the way that people and, and governments and laws relate to one another um, in highly dynamic environments. What are we missing here? What have we not talked about? What have we not thought about? Uh, you hear Mark talk about a real efficiency change that, that sort of large providers and cloud services could bring to cybersecurity. Are well, you buying it? Well, I always buy everything, um, because, not because I'm naive, but because I think the basic proposition that I've heard here is a very simple one, which is God favors the big battalion, so that if you have more energy capability, you could turn things over. What you can do is essentially can put out the, the, the total possibilities, and the way I think of this is a kind of as a production possibilities curve going back to the olden days, and the first thing that everybody wants on one of these systems is to have speed of connectivity back and forth across person. Um, that both within companies and across companies, within nations and across nations, uh, within private industry and across the government and so forth. And if in fact what you want is absolute speed, then you want no security devices whatsoever because there's simply no reason why you want to have to go through some sort of a gate. What you'd like to do is to have a new technology, like for example the ones you see on the bridges now where you don't stop and pay tolls. They just leave the license plate, and you wouldn't even bother to read the license plate. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to have absolute security, then the only way to do this is to take a sand tablet, find yourself a little ancient pen and stylus, and do everything, uh, not in code, but in sand. And that way, nobody will ever steal it, but at the same time, nobody will ever use it either. And so the question that you have to figure out is just how it is that you start to run these kinds of trade-offs, and what are the things that you're going to do? And what I kind of point out is I can't tell you about the technology, but I have a pretty good instinct as to what some of the problems are going to be. And so the first problem you have to worry about is the coordination problem, is how big is the entity that you use in order to create this kind of umbrella? And, you know, one would say, well, we'd love to have a huge system which covers everybody. And that's roughly like saying the way we solve all the political problems in the world is to have a world government and to get rid of states. Uh, what happens is the moment you admit too many people into this particular system, you're no better than your weakest and least reputable part. And so the more you expand this, the more any particular breach is going to cost you. And you start getting very, very nervous about all of that stuff. And, and so what you do is you kind of develop enclaves. So on the internet highway, they turn out to be internet addresses. And these are basically private property arrangements. And then anybody who owns a system of private property knows that they don't give equal access in the building to everybody. Think of a hotel. There's some floors you just push a button, others you get a key, and the others you get an armed guard in order to get to. And you have to design exactly those kinds of systems here to figure out just how much. This is not a new problem. If you go back to any old company and just ask them how they dealt with trade secrets, they're a unitary conception in the law, but they are not a unitary conception uh, when it's turning out about in practice. There's some of them which are short-lived, and you'll send them through a tube. There's others which are a little bit more valuable, and it turns out you may have to have a messenger. And then their thirds, what they do is they frisk you, they make you put your hands up, they take pictures of you, eyes only, and so forth, for a particular purpose. Well, that's exactly the same kind of divisions that you have to be able to build into these security systems uh, once you've figured out what the unit is. So then the next question is, suppose you try to make these things too small. Well, much smaller. If you get too small, you get the following real problems. It means that most of the functionality is going to require you to go across systems, and that's going to be very risky, uh, because now you have to communicate with an alien body, and that just introduces one more set of authentication, IDs, and so forth. And by God, it turns out uh, somebody could put a sham door on there, and you think you're going here, and you're going there. 
so you don't want to make them so small, you don't want to make them so large, and, and so essentially you're back to the standard kind of problem, which is as old as Goldilocks. It's a, this one is too or cooked too much, this one is cooked too middle, this one is cooked in the middle, and, and I think the most important thing that I try to teach my students is I say, I can't tell you anything whatsoever about uh, advanced permanent threats, whatever the acronyms persistent. are, uh, persistent threats, right? You see, I mean, useless on all of that stuff, but I can tell you the following lesson, and it's one that everybody has to learn, which is that life is lived at the margin. Essentially, if you are not at the point where you're really uncertain whether you want to go a little bit more this way or a little bit more that way, then you're just way off the base. Um, what you really want to do when you have a good system is to say that when it comes to the next iteration, you really have to think about which way you're going to start to move on these trade-offs, and that means that you're probably more or less at the right place. And almost invariably, corner solutions don't work in this kind of connectivity kind of market. Some sort of interior solutions are going to have to start to take place. I think in many ways, the real difficulties are, if you're trying to figure out how to put a system together, uh, the line that's going to be perhaps hardest to do is the government line is against the private line, very different kinds of objectives on financial data as opposed to national security, very different cultures on how these things are start to put together, and, and everybody kind of understands all of this, and, and one of the things, and I'll just end on this note, that I find encouraging about this kind of discussion is that people here have worn multiple hats and have gone back and forth from one side to another which means that they absorb more than one kind of culture. And as we know, if you're trying to do a negotiation and you don't understand what the bona fide problems are of the person sitting on the other side of the desk, it's going to be a much more difficult thing to do uh, when you understand that they are facing the same kind of trade-offs that you do. Because the trick in negotiation, given that time is of the essence, is how quickly you converge on a common solution. And if you have people who come from totally different Mars and Venus-like cultures, they won't be able to do that. Well, so this is great. So, Professor Epstein, now that you've sort of given us a sense of, of what life at the margin looks like when, it, when we come to security uh, debates, I thought I might ask Katie a question. So, Katie, you know, one of the big debates about vulnerability disclosure out in the, in the marketplace when you think about the tech titans and industry and national security is this idea that NSA, right, the National Security Agency, their entire mission is to go abroad and exploit foreign systems. And in order to do so, they identify vulnerabilities in foreign systems, potentially vulnerabilities in the software put out by American companies, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, and the like, and they have to make a decision about when to disclose those vulnerabilities to the companies so they can better protect themselves and all the consumers here in the United States and abroad. How do you think about that trade-off? How should the government think about that trade-off? Um, and then I want to see what, what, what's your tell us what you think? I'm interested to know what Jake, what Jake and, uh, and Mark think about it. Yes, yeah, so you're describing what's known as the vulnerability equities process. So how many of you are familiar with this concept, vulnerability equities process? What? Vulnerability equities process. And it's the decision-making process that the government goes through when they stumble upon or acquire through some means a vulnerability that can be exploited um, for a particular purpose. Usually they are uh, looking at it for, you know, for, for specific targeted missions. And um, you see an entire economy built on actually providing these kinds of exploits to the government and other organizations. And this is what I call the offense market. Some people mistake this for a black market. It is not a black market when it's not illegal and there are legal purposes for doing it. So the vulnerability equities process to me is this intricate balance because if you think about it, it's like playing a game of capture the flag, but everybody is running pretty much the same flags, right? So you have to balance the idea of do, you know, do we keep this for a targeted purpose and use it offensively um, to advance, you know, either counterterrorism, looking for, you know, child pornographers, that kind of thing, for law enforcement and counterterrorism purposes? But at the same time, are we leaving our own critical infrastructure exposed to these it, these? vulnerabilities, and how soon do we notify those technology companies so they can start working on a fix? And not all technology companies can fix things as quickly as, you know, 60 days, 30 days, any of those, you know, types of days-long uh, types of disclosures. And then further, even if the fix is out, the lag between the patch being available and people applying the patch tends to be, you know, this... Uh, growing window of, of insecurity. So how do I think about that process, that vulnerability equities process? 
I think about it in terms of wanting to shift the idea from let's look at uh, each individual exploit and vulnerability for its value and shift it to what is the mission focused outcome and can we do that without zero day vulnerabilities? And that's you know the advice that I give our government, the UK government also has just published their vulnerability equities process um, and I you know advise the UK government as well in various capacities and talk to them about that of being much more mission focused because if there's a way you can achieve the same outcome against your target without using an unpatched zero day vulnerability or an exploit, that's much more desirable. And um, there's also a big myth that these organizations like NSA or GCHQ in the UK stockpile these vulnerabilities for a long time. That's, that's just not true. That's not how they actually organize around, uh, around that particular mission. It is very much looking at what are their targets running and what is the most likely way that they can get the access they need on that target without obviously alerting the target that, of their presence? Um, so you see a whole lot of iPhone uh, stuff going around. Um, not so much, you know, back when Windows had a phone, not so much that because nobody was running Windows Phone, right? So you see this market responding to what is the target actually running. And then there's sort of a just-in-time approach of trying to, to deal with this. So that's kind of an overview of what the process is. And like I said, what I think about it is that it's a necessary band of what, of what you know, an organization that is tasked with signals intelligence has to do. SIGINT's going to SIGINT, SPY's going to SPY, right? So now that we are a technology-enabled society, of course, the SPYs are moving into the technology areas. What I disagree with is uh, the notion that it is an all-or-nothing approach, like every single zero-day exploit should be held until you have a, an appropriate target. That kind of stockpiling mentality is absolutely backwards, and that's why I, I you know, encourage people to look for different ways to achieve those types of goals. So, Jake, I assume that I assume that <coughs> if, if if the U.S. government knows about a vulnerability in a Microsoft software, Microsoft yeah. wants to know about it right away. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, I mean, I think as a general matter, I mean, look, everything Katie said is a great overview of the process. I mean, you know, as as a company who, uh, as I mentioned with my opening remarks, is foundationally um, focused on trust. Um, when you have a U.S. government agency um, mucking around globally and, uh, and our trust with our reputation, with our brand, and using our products for perceivably nefarious purposes against other governments, who we also, in cases, do business with as well, I'd say it's a Your nefarious might be our That's national right. security. It's relative. It's right. relative. But um, from our perspective, yes, of course, we wouldn't be supportive of it. But I would say, I mean, Katie, this is a nuance, as she alluded to, this is a very nuanced conversation. Okay. Um, we were heavily engaged, obviously, with the, um, the White House and respective agencies when they went through a reiteration of the VEP. You know, this was announced about a year and a half ago mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, when I first started at Microsoft, um, we, they immediately were going through in um, the White House cybersecurity corner at the time, Rob Joyce, who is an ex-NSA. Well, he's on detail. He's so he back still to is. NSA now. Um, so he obviously was very, uh, very well-versed in the process that NSA uses to go through um, these, these conversations and decisions. And so we were very engaged in trying to help him um, work through an, a, a new iteration of the VET process. And we were focused on two things. So take that general matter sort of perspective and policy from our, uh, from, from our view. But transparency was one of the issues we talked with him a lot about. Look, I mean, what's causing issues a lot with industry is this lack of transparency around the deliberation process. And I think that was something that we focused heavily on with him. The publication, much like Katie alluded to with the Brits as well, the publication of the processes in which the government goes about evaluating these vulnerabilities is helpful for industry to understand what they're doing, what they're deliberating. That was a key issue. The second was this trade-off, which again Katie talked about, which is you know, when you go through an operational discussion and you talk about impact of something you're using um, to get at targets, you know, one criteria should be impact on the business ecosystem or impact on the ecosystem. That should be a factor of consideration. That's things like, Jamil knows this well, LOAC, law of war and armed conflict, and you talk about the impact, the, um, you know, the principles that go into that propagation in the cyber arena is something that causes um, deliberations on LOAC. So all of these related issues about consequences, about additional um, um, responsibilities the government has to evaluate when they make these very difficult decisions, we felt like that was important for them to consider, and frankly, they did make it into the final iteration as being one of the main criteria, but ultimately is an improvement from where they were from our perspective, but it's a delicate and tricky issue, and Wanna Cry Not Petty is a perfect example of, um, you know, most of this is published, so we don't have to worry about it, but um, the open source data suggests that a previous iteration of a vulnerability was used, weaponized by uh, a foreign actor, and then thrown into the ecosystem, which then impacted a number of unpatched systems, and 
very, very difficult ways. White cost a lot of money to people and also actually hit healthcare systems. So actually got to the health of issue, which is a fairly unique case mm -hmm. if you look across the last 10 years. So, so can I just follow um, up with, with, so, with, with a quick question before I turn to Mark? So, so, but Jake, so you want the government <coughs> to tell you about every vulnerability they find on your systems, help you pat, let you let you. We patch start it. with that. We start with that. Start, right, start right. With the, <laughs> knowing knowing that that's not always going to be something they right, agree with. Right. That's, that's, that's your preference. <laughs> but, then, but then at the same time, Microsoft has made clear in recent statements, in fact, is leading a global effort to to encourage companies around the world to not work with their home governments on cyber exploits. So on one end, you want to say, if you find some vulnerability and you're trying to exploit foreign government systems, tell us so we can fix it, so you can't exploit the system. And by the way, if you do want to go exploit foreign systems, don't look to us for any help. So help me understand how then you expect the government to do its job. I mean, that's a good question, and I think it depends on where you sit, right? From Microsoft's perspective, um, as we've always talked about, you know, we want to be a responsible actor in the ecosystem. So without getting too much into Jamil's bomb throwing here, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I, I think you have, to, you have to balance this, again, across the needs of the mission owners, depending upon where you sit. And from our perspective as a company, that open dialogue and frank dialogue with the government is important. And you know, we'll continue to do that from our perspective. Um, we recognize, you know, look, they're focused on the defense of the United States. We understand that, just like any other country would be. Um, but it's important to recognize that as defenders of customers and a lot of civilians out in the world, we also have to be um, open and frank with them about the costs of some of these activities, and I think we'll continue that dialogue. It's not going to, you know, begin or end here, but it's a good point to make. So, Mark, you know, Amazon's taking a little bit of a different approach, and, and Professor Epstein, I'll be, I'll be right, right over to you. But, um, but Amazon's taking a little bit of a different approach, which is to say, Amazon has said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna work with the government. We're gonna work, and, and Microsoft works extensively with the government mm -hmm. across huge enterprises. But Amazon sort of said, in, in an environment where, you know, other companies are pushing back, and saying, well, maybe, maybe not. Google with Project Maven, right? Apple with, with the iPhone and the encryption. Um, Amazon sort of said, we're actually going to sort of turn into this. And, 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 and Jeff has said, look, I, you know, I, I, we're going to do the C2S thing, right? Um, at the same time, to be sure, you want to know if the government finds vulnerabilities in your systems. How do you guys think about this balance that we were just, that Jake and I were just talking about um, and Katie and I were talking about, about, um, about the, the needs of the government to have some vulnerabilities and some access to government systems, sorry, to foreign government systems that might be running in the AWS cloud or on Microsoft Azure um, or, or vulnerabilities that might not have been disclosed. How do you guys think about that question when it comes to national level uh, issues? Our focus is on building a safe and secure <coughs> platform for anyone who uses it. The, our government is a very big user of our platform, so we see no benefit to um, delays in disclosure of things that might actually impact them as much as anyone else. So I think, um, you know, it, maybe it's um, naive, but I think if you think of these platform vendors as those saying, look, you can have a fair fight if you want to have a fair fight, but, you know, bugs and, and defensive work is just different than offensive work. And um, if we can make sure that w the platform is operating as designed, then all users, including governments, are going to have a better day than if we, you know, leave things, leave things unpatched. Now, obviously, we don't, we take a lot of responsibility in our own hands. We have a massive amount of what the government calls red teaming that goes on that we sponsor and both internal and external teams we're constantly trying to break into our own system so we hopefully are doing a good job discovering those long before anyone else does of course that's impossible to say that that will always be true uh, but it's a it's a huge focus for us um, so in general we haven't con and, and and frankly we haven't you know, at least so far in our cloud business we haven't really gotten interesting intelligence from the government on some of these topics yet against your own systems against yeah, yeah, your against consumer our systems company. god bless right. So well, not not in our cloud business. It's a very much a business and government business. Oh, oops. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So oh. Professor, actually, I want to turn to you, and then I, I want to open up the audience because I know I'm sure there are folks that have yeah. questions out there. If you don't, I will continue to ask questions. But uh, Professor, Epstein, what are I, we? I have the following yeah. thing, which is whenever I want to answer the question, I want to challenge the question. Oh, great. And the way you put the question is, how do you inform Microsoft? And I think that's the wrong way to put the. Question. Was what now? Uh, how you inform Microsoft was the company you gave. What happens is the question in many cases, Microsoft is a very big entity with lots of points of entry. And if you look at other kinds of systems, it turns out that oftentimes what you try to do is to find some localized entity inside the larger company to which you give the information, where you think it would be used for the greatest benefit with the highest degree of security, and not let it go out to other systems which you think are less important. Now, let me give you a couple of examples of how this partition works in, in, in pre-cyberspace life, because it kind of suggests what's going on here. Uh, one of these things is in copyrights, there's always the question, have you copied something from somebody else? 
And you bring somebody from another firm who has a lot of information property on the other thing, and you're worried that you're going to find yourself in real trouble if their input ends up in your product. So you create an institution known as the clean room. And what you do is you take a bunch of guys, send them off to some Idaho farm place for a day. You say, you guys are out of communication with the rest of the world. Develop this project, keep a log, store it in some kind of independent source so you could verify what's going on. And so you don't want to give the information to the full company. You want to give it to a subset. And I think that's got to happen here. Uh, another situation is I spent a fair bit of time working with the um, pharmaceutical industry on what they call the BPCIA, uh, which is uh, not your part of the world, but it's my beat. It's the Biological Price Competition and Innovation Act, which is actually a section of the Obamacare bill unrelated to everything else. And the real question there is how you share information about the techniques that are used in order to make biologics, which are very complicated drugs. And so if you just give the formula without giving the trade secrets, it cannot be done. You can't get competition. And this statute contains enormous amounts of provisions as to who can see what kind of information for what purposes, who is going to be excluded from the information for what purposes and why. And it seems to me that that approach clearly has to be done here. So if I thought there was a national security issue and I wanted to fix the bug, I don't want to go to Microsoft and have them fix it with things that I may not care about, but I certainly want to have somebody in Microsoft who's a designated national security high profile officer, and then you have some situation. So what you're doing here is you're taking the traditional views on trade secrets, which I alluded to earlier on, and trying to capture how it is that you do this in a much more fluid environment. And my guess is that they're not telling me, uh, but something like this is probably already being done today uh, because it's essentially this constant question of how do you give the information for the things that you want to get across and not compromise other systems where the information is a negative social. What do you do, though, if you're the government and uh, when you go to Microsoft or Apple or Amazon or whoever it might be, I don't mean to pick on any particular company, and they say, thanks, we're not interested? Oh, well, that's a different, I mean, on, on the cleanup stuff, that's I mean, you know, I believe in effect that this is a very serious sort of uh, can we coerce subpoena type stuff. We require people to turn off documents all the time when they don't want to do so. And if it turns out you've got something which is encrypted in cyberspace and you have the key to it, the government can essentially do it. And then the question is, what kind of protection do we start to give? And you want a warrant, probable cause, limited disclosures, whatever these things are going to be there. But I do not believe, if it turns out to be a national security question, that a company can, if it has stuff which the government thinks is necessary for national security, simply say that we're outside the general system of social coercion, whatever the standard rules are elsewhere. Let me just general for one point. Uh, everybody here is much more into the latest technology than little old me. But I spend my life worrying about, well, does this particular Roman law mechanism have any live play with respect to the modern law? What is it that we can learn from systems that were developed 2,000, 1,000, 50 years ago in order to give us some larger sense of the production possibilities in this kind of space? And I think that you can actually learn a great deal from that. And one of the things that you learn from Fourth Amendment law um, is that you know you may have to have probable cause, you may have to go before a magistrate, you may have to describe things particularly that you need, that so forth, but somebody cannot simply say, we ain't given that to you. And so the hard question is, can Apple disable right, a phone so that when it turns out it may contain national security issue, uh, that nobody can get to it unless they get this guy who's already been gassed and killed or sent back to Russia or something of this sort? I do not regard that as a self-evident truth. It's the classic case. If you want to keep that stuff secret, you love the Apple encryption program, but if you're trying to get it out and you think the H-bomb or something like it might turn on it, not so kind. Uh, I recall years ago, I worked on a program where the question was whether or not you could have a backdoor into some data transmissions in the late 80s, and we came to the conclusion, uh, and I testified on this, uh, that the problem about the back door is that everybody but the government would get into it, and so that it was probably more dangerous from a security point of view than otherwise. <laughs> and so that's a structural design, but this is not a categorical rule that the government can always be kept off the premises. It may need you have to have a lot more subtle ways of running the interaction. Well, I, can't, I can't resist, but go ahead, Jake. I just wanted to add one point at the end, which... Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, Curious to get Katie's thoughts on this too, but the last point, just to, I just had an additional thought um, hearing the panel speak on this, which was the last point we also raised to the government as part of the BEP discussion was um, 
you know, how you maintain and keep an eye on some of these capabilities. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in some of these cases, they've gotten... Yeah, how, do, how do they not break out into one? Yeah, yeah they, they've gotten pillaged from the U.S. government, right, in some of these cases. So the other, the other threshold question we raised was, look, if, if, if these are capabilities that may, may be akin to, you can find your sort of parallelism in, in more kinetic warfare, but if they're akin to that, there should be a stronger conversation about the protections in place that protect these capabilities too. And I think that's an important part of that conversation as well. So I think it's super important to point out there is a difference in these new debates from any previous debate. That's a good point. The technology companies are inventing technologies which disable them as providers yes. from accessing yes. the yes. data. So the government can say, here's a subpoena, go do it. But what they're then saying is you have to go, co we're coercing you to go develop entirely new technology to break the technology that you already invented. You do not want to do that by subpoena. Well, that, so that's the difference. There's no existing capability in, in these new technologies for the companies to, in any straightforward fashion, give the data that has been requested. Well, if you, no. if you intentionally create a key and intentionally throw it away and melt it down. you got, a, you got a panel right. on this. There may be others. No, we have a panel on this. But, but I actually do, I am interested to hear Katie's thoughts on this because, you know, Professor Epstein, I think, said two different and potentially contradictory things, right? Which is, on one hand, you should go, if you if you can't, if they say no, if the company's, you knock on the door and they say, not interested, the answer is go get a subpoena. That's to then, get data, but, but not to get assistance in labor. So uh, when so they want to data, break but the if, Apple phone, they don't go back to Apple to try to do this. You go to some Israeli company and... <laughs> which is back to how that it played out. At, which is the way it played out and get them to figure out if they could get something. And then Apple learns about that and there's the next iteration going forward. The only thing that you can use a subpoena for is to gain information. I think it's a terribly dangerous situation to use it to try to get labor because labor is a generalized commodity that you could hire in other places. And subpoenas should only be used when there's one person who has a distinctive asset that nobody else can supply. But Katie, imagine a world in which it's just just one person has the information. You think Professor Epstein's right that you should be able to get a subpoena and just and get access to that data? Let's say it's not the world where Mark is, where Mark is correctly laid out that we live in today, where you know companies just sort of create scenarios where they they themselves cannot get in, would have to create new technology to get in. Right? If they have the ability to get in, should a go the government with the subpoena have the ability to go in and, and and force you to open it up? Well, I mean, I think that that speaks to Professor Epstein's point about what subpoenas are really useful for, and then also to Mark's point in that if we actually build the technology that is, you know, effectively uh, spy-proof to the, the builders of technology, you end up insulating yourself from the subpoena attack. Yeah. But you may have created, um, you know, inadvertently created a marketplace for third parties to try and break that technology, and that's exactly what we see in play another, right now. It's futile to try to regulate this because last I looked, this was a global market. And if you announce that the United States doesn't allow you to make these you can't see through technologies, it's amazing how much stuff is going to come out of 42 other companies which will do exactly that. And so what you have to do is you have to keep yourself in the market. And then on the hunt for Red October or whatever it is, chances are international cooperation in addition to a subpoena power is going to be needed because many of these people are going to be located elsewhere where you cannot get them. And so uh, it's Interpol all over again at a much higher level. One last question before we go to the audience. I really, I'm sorry, could I just, just yeah, make Martin. people aware? So Australia recently passed a law within yes. the last week, which... Ports to do exactly what we were saying shouldn't be done. Yeah. So, that idea. so one last question. So let's say we have this scenario where now the government goes out and, and obtains a, a exploit to the to they don't they they go to the company. The company says nope, can't do it. We built a system that we that enable that disables us from even getting access to it. So we can't get it for you. <laughs> government goes to another company, obtains the ability to get access. Now the government knows about a vulnerability in this theoretically secure system that the company created, even secure for themselves. Should the government disclose that vulnerability back to the company? The company having sorted said to the government, go pound sand. Should the government now disclose the vulnerability and say, okay, we found a way in, we got the data we wanted, now take this vulnerability and go, please go fix it. That's, Probably, that's yeah. actually what happens. No, but but yeah. should, Probably, does yes. that make Once sense? Once they're done using it, they usually do tell the company. So that is, that is I actually. Think, I think the answer is an easy okay. yes. An easy yes. But what if they need it going forward? Well, I mean, what but happens we is... We say, well, we can't help I mean, you. Look, if it, it, let's put it this way. It's an easy yes if you believe that their ability to create vulnerable free technology is something that we want. And then, in effect, if you could start to fix it after you've gotten your thing, this is a case of having your cake and eating it, too. And, you know, we've been talking about lots of trade-offs, but once in a while in this world, it turns out that they're easy cases, and what you ought to do is to clap rather than fret. Interesting. Okay, to so, the audience. Hold on. Yeah. Oh, there's, no, not to the was, audience. There was, a, there was a point made earlier that I want to clarify, which is um, 
While I absolutely agree the economies of scale applied to securing systems that are enabled by you know, cloud providers is absolutely um, on point as being you know, something that can raise, elevate the security of, of those deployed systems, so either cloud provider over here, but there's an important data point here in that you know, this is a problem of people, process, and technology, right? And so the technology is rising to the occasion. The process um, at the technology vendors, especially the cloud technology vendors, is rising to the occasion. But we still have critical, critical under-resourced, uh, you know, component in the people element. And the very important uh, how this actually plays out is that WannaCry, right? We keep talking about WannaCry. That was a worm that broke out a couple of months after a patch was publicly available. The patch was not applied to key systems, hence um, it enabled the spread of this worm. Now, you would think that after that huge incident that caused real-world damage, that everybody would have disabled SMB version 1, which was the vulnerable component. They didn't. Now, I bring it back wow. to the cloud deployments. Unfortunately, since WannaCry, there has been an increase in the prevalence of SMB version 1 exposed to the internet. Why? Because the lack of people at these companies who are sort of buying and deploying cloud technology, they did not know that if you take this default installation and you don't you know, buy the hardening services from your cloud provider, um, and you're, you're just thinking, oh, this is a default installation, it must be baseline, pretty much OK, secure, that's been the problem. And there's been an increase in the number of exposed internet systems um, that, that have SMB version one. So I just wanna like kind of pull the thread on that one that yes, people and process has gotten better, or sorry, the process and technology has gotten better, but the people element and the fact that we have a critical um, you know, gap yeah. in qualified security professionals and all of these un unfilled jobs, and these are, this is not getting better. This is a problem that's getting much and much uh, you know, more prevalent. Um, so that false sense of security is still happening, and it's happening at global wormable scale. And, and it raises the question of how we how we build that capacity domestically. I mean, the reality is is that it, this goes back to our migration system and the challenges we have, where we bring some of the world's most most capable people here, we educate them, and say you must go home and practice your craft back at home. Um, so with that, let me turn to the audience. We have about twenty minutes left. We'd love to take some uh, questions from the audience. I think there's a microphone somewhere around here, uh, right there at the back. Um, so if you if you'd like to ask questions, raise your hand um, and. Uh, the gentleman there in the red sweater will bring you a microphone. So, anybody? Questions from the audience? Uh, right here in the front. Uh, thank you, Anna Simpson. I just want to continue what you said. So, you pose the question as the gap isn't being filled, but what is the response from the cloud providers on that? I, I would just want to take a Mark, or do you want is it to direct? Well, I would just say, I mean, the conversations we've been having is frankly around automation. And when you have the conversation with the customer, go, look, these are the four security basic principles that we can just apply. I, I, I'm simplifying, but a template based approach where we automate some of that in the front end so that you take the decisional aspects out of it on the people part and you inoculate them from some of the obvious vulnerabilities. I mean, these are very basic things, two factor among many others. Um, but we try to automate that process on the front end to try to manage some of that risk. But it's not always perfect. But it's really just having a front end conversation with the customer and trying to gauge, you know, what they're looking to do and, and what's most important to them. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, the problem is you may never have a, a conversation with the customer. In fact, some of our best customers are ones we never talk to, right? They just That's click true. and buy, right? That's they just true. Click and buy. Just swipe a credit card and run up a nice uh, cloud bill. Consumer enterprise, um, yeah. <laughs> actually, no, but the point is well taken. We're trying to make it so that the default settings, the warnings that are built in, are constantly uh, being tuned to meet the fact that people make misconfiguration. It's, misconfigurations are common. There's quite a few that we sort of automatically handle today. We constantly discover new ones that people, mistakes people make, and we are constantly chasing that with technology to make it less likely or harder to make those mistakes. We can't in principle say you may not do X because the customer intent, we don't have the technology yet to infer intent. The person might be running a honeypot. They want to be hacked, right? That's a perfectly valid use case for a cloud platform. So you can't say in principle, you cannot run, we will block all your SMB1 protocol, or we will, uh, we'll, you know, if we detect a, you know, um, uh, your, an old open SSL library that's vulnerable, we'll, we, we will block that, that protocol. We can't do that um, yet anyway. If, now, if people could express intent, um, and I think we'll get there. We're getting more and more sophisticated with the way that the kind of user experience with these platforms. 
And so it may be that come to, it may come a time where you have to in some way indicate, hey, I'm a security researcher, leave me alone, right? And then the platform will back off. Um, but I think we'll get to the point where for the average user, we can do a whole lot by automation and by inferring intent, which is please keep me safe. Um, and, uh, but it'll never be perfect, but I think we can get better. We also just need to educate people better. Like we, you know, uh, classic uh, kind of analogy, like may make people get driver's licenses or drive on the road. We, not that we should have, you know, browsing licenses, but we ought to make it so that every citizen of a, of a, of a country is aware of basic ideas around what are stupid and what are smart ways to use uh, computer systems. And I, so far, I think we are really weak in that regard. Sir? Hi, yeah. Uh, my name is Roger Chen. I'm uh, original came from China, so I'm very co concerned about you know uh, security uh, issue related to China. Yeah, I believe all the people here uh, hear about uh, the news. You know, Huawei in China is number one uh, telecommunication company in the world, but their uh, CFO Meng Wanzhou actually is a daughter of the founder <laughs> was uh, arrested in Can uh, Canada you know, by US you know, a request. And our government tried to extract, extract it, you know, her to US uh, because her involvement with uh, Iran and you know, like kind of a technology sale you know, using US technology. Yeah. So, uh, so, because uh, Huawei is a leader in 5G technology, 5G is greatly influenced you know, in all kind of technology, even in the enterprise, big enterprise or autonomous driving and cell phone, right? So it definitely is a threat to our country. So my question to you, each, yeah, what do you think our government's decision, whether we should you know, it's tradition Wanzhou to US, you know, and to uh, be trial in our core system, yeah. Thank Let's you. start on the far end with Professor Epstein. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's just actually vaguely a legal question, which means that we don't have a principled answer for it. Um, <laughs> but, but let me try to go through it. A lot of it depends upon whether you think this woman is innocent or guilty, and whether or not you can show probable cause. Uh, the reason why this problem has become so acute in this particular case is that the United States in its trade war against China is quite willing to use tactics which most free trade economists like myself regard as excessive, uh, going after things that you ought not to do. We don't push the WTO alternatives perhaps enough, focus enough on intellectual property. So there is around the United States actions always the suspicion that we've got the larger collateral agenda unrelated to this. But on the other hand, the Huawei situation, as best I can tell it, uh, the espionage charges do not begin, or the contamination of the computer stuff, with Donald Trump. They were something which were considered to be important yeah, previously. And, and so what happens is, uh, what you're doing is you're sitting here <laughs> on the outside trying to make these kinds of judgments, and you simply do not have the information which allows you to make the relevant determinations. And the second point is, this is not the situation where we would like this all to be public. We don't want to have somebody saying, well, this is where Huawei has managed to penetrate Western um, networks and so forth, which then give them opportunities to correct themselves. Uh, so like all of this stuff, it turns out that you want public accountability and uh, transactional secrecy, and that's not going to go away in this particular age. That problem is with us. I cannot tell you which way I think the judgments go because I'm not a guy who knows the probabilities. You have four people on my panel who've forgotten how to practice law, but they actually know what's going on in the transaction. Right. Mark, thoughts? Huawei? Uh, you could decline the answer. Yeah, I mean, you should decline. You know too much. Oh. I know nothing. See, I could talk freely. I'll just say this. I think so, you know, supply chain security is a very, very important topic, and it's one that we've been focusing on for a while. Our customers are now waking up to how important it is. Um, we do a lot. I think we can, we can do more, but I think we're in pretty good shape, but we want to get much, much better. And it's, um, it's a challenge. But um, again, I, I don't want to sound like a, you know, a salesman up here, but I think that a large-scale provider, we can put the attention and the resources and the focus on 
the tooling we need to make sure that like techno you know hardware that enters our environments is is safe and sane, uh, and do that on a very you know very broad scale because the, the again the economies of scale are, are favorable in that case if you can do design and test and um, sampling and debugging of millions and millions of systems with a you know a large team but relative by, you know by the ratio between humans needed and servers under management is, is very very favorable for a large provider. So I think I think we're in, in pretty good shape on that. But it's very good that people are folks that, you know, the super micro article that hit um, a few months ago was made a bit of a firestorm. And it turns out the article's false, but it I know kind of a funny way it, it it was good because people are thinking about things they should be thinking about and previously weren't thinking about. There is this kind of very simple issue: that ch a chain, a physical chain, is no stronger than its weakest link. And so when you're dealing with supply chain technology. Uh, if you make it really thin, you could get it really long. But on the hand, if you get it really long, it may turn out to be very vulnerable at only one point that snips everything. And so the trade-off that these guys are always facing is the level of redundancy as opposed to the speed of operations. And this is true with every neural system uh, that you're going to face, every communication system. I am actually about to write a paper with the impressive title called Law and Geometry. And the purpose of this is to explain why certain kinds of functions have very different perimeter to area ratios than others, and what that does to vulnerability, communication, production, and so forth. And you start with the human body, and we have two connective systems, circulatory and information neurological. But nobody ever thinks that you could have a liver that's long and skinny or a neuron that could be short and compact. And the supply chains are the long and skinny stuff, and they are much more vulnerable to being snipped and corrupted uh, than the solid organs so, that you have. In so we just went from, from cyber supply chains to geometry to the human, uh, the human body. Katie, uh, Jake, any thoughts on the question uh, about Huawei? Um, you know, I do have some thoughts about it. It's, uh, so 5G is, is representative of the United States no longer leading in advanced technology. This is one of the adjustments that we have to make um, in the United States when we think about our position in the world as leaders in, in technology and um, internet-enabled technology in particular and communications technology, and, um, and accept the fact that our innovation lead is being closed in on and surpassed by um, you know te technology, not necessarily, but by technology that's being developed in countries that we might have some some issues with. So I think this is a this is an adjustment and self reflection point where we have enjoyed a significant technological lead for for quite some time, and when we think about new technology like five G, that is is the future of you know how wireless communications happen, we have to make choices about accepting this technology that is led by another country or being left behind. And I think that's that's sort of the, the big you know tipping point where we are right now, where not all of the leading technology will be developed in the United States. The antitrust law has much too much to do with this. Jake? I mean, nothing else to add other than I'm, I would agree with um, Mark's comments on supply chain. That it is the epicenter of conversations um, these days, both in D.C. and globally, about how much you manage the risk across your supply chain, particularly when you have big providers um, globally. And so I would just say that we're focused on trying to make sure that we're having the right conversations. And I would just note that uh, would, it, it, since we planted the question in the audience, um, the um, which I did not, but um, the National Security Institute at George Mason will actually be publishing a paper on Huawei and ZT and the questions about 5G um, and their role in the global telecommunications infrastructure probably in the next two weeks. So if you're if you're around uh, later on today, please sign up for our mailing list. We'll send out a copy of that paper uh, here shortly, and it'll be it'll be I think worth the read. Um, okay, more questions for that. It's right right down here on the left hand side. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if the panel could talk about uh, cloud security. So with deployment of the cloud over the past several years, there's huge economic benefits, but I'd say also it's probably created a lot of um, uh, dangers vis-a-vis uh, -vis cloud security. So could the panel maybe talk about if they feel the vendors are responsible for cloud security or if it's the companies or if it's a combination of both? Well, since we got two cloud vendors, the, the two cloud, biggest cloud vendors out there, Microsoft and, uh, and AWS. Um, Jake? I can tell you what they have to say. Oh, really? <laughs> well, if they want to boast, they're going to start giving implied and express warranties. Jake? You want me to go first, Mark? Go ahead. Right. 
Um, I'd just say a couple of things on it. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I'd say, you know, as our approach to cloud continues to evolve, it's really about scale and integration, right? And so we can just uh, see so many of the different touch points, analyze so quickly, and then respond. It's a big paradigm shift security-wise. Of course, that introduces completely different security conversations as um, we work with customers and others. I mean, I would say to your, to your question, it is twofold. It depends upon the contractual relationship of what we're talking to with vendors. And in some cases, we're contractually obligated by not looking on stuff that we're housing. And so in other cases, we're working closely with a vendor to do different things on the security side. So I would say it just depends. Um, I wouldn't flag any other broader issues other than to say that you, know, you probably saw some recent announcements from the White House that they are worried about foreign actors getting into managed security um, providers. And then also, I, I don't know if they said a CSP as well, um, but they may have, but it was you know presumably leaked about some of the names there. So I would say the U.S. government's very focused on um, once you get inside an architecture, can you maneuver around independently inside the different tenants and what that access looks like. So that is an ongoing security conversation. Um, I'll leave it to my, my um, very deep technical experts on the panel next to me to talk about multi-tenant architecture. But I would say from our perspective, um, each security setup is different, but that's a very challenging conversation for the government to have because I don't know if they have a full understanding about how we architect some of our cloud solutions and we're continuing to have those conversations with them to help them understand the real risks and manage them. Mark? We always start with the mantra, it's a shared responsibility. We do not take ultimate responsibility for customer security. If to do, In order to do that, we'd have to be a managed service provider of their entire application stack, which we are not. Mm -hmm. They are responsible for their deployments and their usage of the platform. That said, the cloud will take care of a huge number of things that the customers used to have to worry about in their physical and on-premises deployments. So if you look at the FedRAMP control set, 280 controls, 240 controls, depending on the, the, the profile, um, the cloud itself will essentially eliminate 100 or more of those are simply you don't need to worry about. That leaves 100, there's, a, there's about 40 to 60 that are kind of shared, like we have to do some things right, you have to do some things right, and then there's you know, 40 or 60 or so that the customer is still responsible for. Now, we do a lot to make it easy to do that last 60. We have, you know, accelerators and guides and automation. We have literally an orchestration template that says, run this code and you will have a FedRAMP compliant three-tier web application. And it's just stood, stand, stood up for you. And then we'll do drift detection to see if it act deviates from the known baseline. So we make it really easy, quote unquote, I mean, literally much easier than it ever has been to build and run secure systems, but you can, you're can you still responsible and people can still make mistakes and so there's still issues that, that do arise. As yeah. far as the platform itself is concerned, there may be an implication in the question that is the cloud itself less secure than on-prem deployments? I'm not sure if that was implied or not, but I think most customers' experience is that once they develop the skills and they get accustomed to tooling and they, and they gain experience, very consistently our customers say, I feel more confident in my cloud-based deployments than my on-prem deployments. In my own data centers, I literally don't know what some of the servers do. I have racks of gear that like, either they have labels on them, which is horrible security practice, because that means anybody in there knows what they do, which they shouldn't. Or I literally, there's a, I talked to a company, said so we, we had an audit, we, did, we found there were 1,400 servers in our DMZ, which means an internet connected part of our data center, that we didn't know what they did. We couldn't figure it out. Ooh, that's not good. Um, now, could you do that in a cloud? I suppose if you were really, really stupid, you could, but you know. <laughs> Um, the, the tooling, at least, at least you know the basic, like who started it, you know, why it's running there. It's all just kind of built in because of the API driven nature of the environment. Um, and so I think it's a big leg up, but yes, there, there's definitely, it's not a panacea. You can still build in secure systems. You still have to be careful. You have to be responsible. Um, but I think the technology is helping. Can I ask one simple question? Do you guys have consequential damage limitation clauses in your contract? We do. But we also, they're, 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 you know, we have, a, we have a shrink wrap agreement, click through, swipe yeah. a credit card. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, pretty basic. And, and we have in negotiated agreements with the big customers as well. Yeah. I mean, but you do have some limitation on those. And then there's some conditions in there. This is, you know, basically the traditional law coming forward to the modern environment. Yeah. And, there's, and there is uh, there's cybersecurity insurance markets that have sprung up, which is exactly what you do when you have risks that people don't want to... Um, 
They want, want to share in kind of an economic way. And they can't switch it back and forth. They put it off on a third party and <clears> pay <throat> part of the premium. Right. Yeah. So this is part of the traditional common law stuff, and mm -hmm. consequential damages have been part of the law since people have had studied. Hadley v. Baxendale. Well, actually, they got it wrong in Hadley v. <laughs> Baxendale, but that's the case. Jake, you have something to say? I, just, I, I would just echo this shared responsibility, which is a good point that Mark, Mark made from the outset. Um, and I would just add, too, that we're increasingly seeing this hybrid approach, right, where there are certain things they really want to have the customer or some data on site or for specific reasons. And so this hybrid approach, in addition to the cloud conversation, is ongoing and evolving. And Katie, any last thoughts on cloud security? Yeah, um, the last thoughts on uh, fully managed versus, you know, hybrid approach, et cetera. The fact of the matter is the number of vulnerabilities that any administrator of any systems, whether it's the cloud service provider or your organization, the number of vulnerabilities that they have to consider, are we vulnerable or not, and how do we uh, apply a patch or a mitigation, has increased dramatically in the last few years. If you just look at um, you know, common vulnerabilities and exposures, just CVE numbers, and not all vulnerabilities that are publicly known get a CVE number. So if you even just look at that subset, it's about 40 vulnerabilities per day that are coming out that an organization would have to consider, are we or aren't we vulnerable? So when we're thinking about you know, moving up to the cloud and have them manage it, or we're managing it in-house, or some kind of combination, just understand that the scale of the problem has become untenable in sort of a rapid deployment, rapid response sense. So that's, to me, a, a bigger problem in the fact that the, the, there's no real, um, you know, well-defined way to manage risk when it comes to new vulnerabilities that are coming out um, that affect all systems. You know, any of the cloud-deployed systems, if a new vulnerability in OpenSSL comes out, everybody's vulnerable at the same time. You know, this doesn't give you any special protection. It's not like they got, I'm in you know, uh, right. And, and so, um, so that element, I think, is something to consider in modern computing, in the complexity and just the sheer number of decisions that anybody who is trying to secure systems has to make. And I promised my panelists that I would give them a chance to give their last thoughts on the topic. So let me start at the, at the far end with Professor Epstein, all the yeah, way over here I to mean, Jake. Again, uh, the message that I would want to uh, leave with everybody is whenever you start seeing a new problem, try to figure out how you can back out from some other problem in order to get there. Uh, because this consequential damage, law of condition stuff is there. Mark made the joke about um, Hadley and Baxendale, the great case on contractual limitation. Uh, but this is the problem. Uh, the decision decided on itself that lost profits was not the appropriate measure of damage in a case where there was a misshipment of a crankshaft, but it didn't tell you what the correct measure was and gave you no idea of how to get it. Uh, so for a lawyer looking at these kinds of things, our particular problem is as you move into these new areas, two things happen simultaneously. One is the percentage of vulnerabilities go down. That's courtesy of Mark Ryland. And two, as the scope of the ambition is so much greater, even if the probability goes down, the absolute number may well go up because you're doing so much more, uh, which turns out to be Katie. I can't do anything to solve these problems. My job as a lawyer is not to do a shrink rack contract. It's as much to be a shrink and to sort of listen to people <laughs> and what they say and then try to figure out which way you want to put the contracts, which leave them in the, in the comfort zone. And as Mark said, and I will end on this simple note, is oftentimes risk shifting between the parties is inefficient for both. A common insurance policy may well be better. That has been true of contracts from the beginning of time. And so what happens is in the midst of everything new, don't forget that knowing something old is from time to time helpful. Mark. Back to the main theme of the, of the, top, of the, of the panel, and I said this really at the beginning, but just to reemphasize, I think the key thing to that is happening now in terms of the so-called tech titans and these cyber issues is that business issues, are, our interests are aligning with doing security as a high priority. And that's something that I think was not typical in a more fragmented type of uh, IT culture in which you had dozens and dozens of suppliers and each, each was only responsible for one element. Dell would sell you a really great server and Microsoft would sell you a really great operating system. And, so, you know, Oracle would sell you a really great database, but, but the, it was, you know, the intersection of those things that manage those things and the fact that all these processes were highly manual uh, made for a lot of technical debt, a lot of things that just are too manual, they're just never updated, they're never patched. Um, and the, the growth of these more automated systems, these large-scale systems, I think, does align in the right way. We have very, very strong business interest in building secure systems and in choosing the more expensive or painful default rather than the cheap, easy one, because on the whole, our business has benefited 
uh, you know, for us, a, a big security incident is like it's it's a it's a yeah, it, it's yeah, it's just a matter of survival. I mean, that could be a, the death of our company. So so it really, in some ways, I think there's again, it's there's no magic silver bullet. Everything's still hard work. We all have to work at it. But I think. There are many good things happening that will um, enable the industry to get better to raise the bar. And the, the broader theme really is just IT modernization. We just have too many really ancient systems that have just been running for too long and no one understands how they work. And you know they're just sitting out there uh, with lots of uh, latent problems. And so I think um, we have to focus on getting, getting systems uh, updated and modernized and cloud is part of that. Like the subways. Katie? Well, you know, as I said in my opening, um, I think we, we built the internet with the idea of sharing in mind, um, and that was, you know, the original academic purpose. And then we built everything else that society depends on on top of that. Um, so I think that, you know, we can't rewind the clock. And I do remember a much smaller internet that we were preparing for an upcoming known disaster, Y2K. It was such a small internet back then, um, you know. And uh, if we think about where we are right now. Even the age of the modern smartphone, where you've got you know a computer many times more capable uh, than you know the, the you know the moon landing computers were uh, in the palm of your hand in your pocket, that smartphone technology has only been prevalent for a little over a decade. You know, in its in its wide use, we're seeing things like not just the internet growing in scale um, and you know the intractability of trying to manage that scale, but we're also seeing the biggest influx of new users of the internet coming from all kinds of countries, some of which are underdeveloped otherwise in terms of infrastructure. So huge areas are parts of Southeast Asia and Africa that you know, may not have other infrastructure, but they have mobile technology. And they are doing, you know, they're doing things. And that's, I think, some of the biggest growth areas um, you know, for the internet as we see it evolving. Um, so from tiny internet of you know, 25 years ago to where we are today, we haven't actually dealt with some of the underlying problems, certainly technologically, architecturally, but in terms of governance and the way that we interact in what's becoming sort of the driver of a new world order. I feel like we're at, you know, we're at some kind of crossroads on uh, the fact that we, you know, the United States, again, was the leading dominant provider of these technologies. But in a lot of ways, it's kind of like, you know, the British Empire's Royal Navy dominating the seas until other technology took over. And our part in the world and the global infrastructure of the world is changing, and we have to project further than where we have been in the past, project further not just our ability to influence global regulations and adoption of technology, but progress further into thinking that we're not going to be the Royal Navy of the, of the Internet Sea for very much longer. And we need to accept that position and understand how we can work in the emerging Internet, not the Internet of today, but the Internet that we are going to have in four or five years. So Jake? First and last out rules apply, you get the last word. <laughs> yeah. um, it's probably going to be an iteration of um, the smart panelists that have come before me, but I'd say a couple of things. You know, we haven't really talked a lot about the nation state issue that we started with the national dialogue. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, I guess uh, it's useful just reiterating that this intersection with technology, national issues, international um, relationships, the way companies have to now throw up a flag like they're a government, that we are not governments but you're expected to have conversations at the geopolitical level that are ongoing, and then you have intersections with, call it what you want, war, call it um, conflict, call it other issues that are popping up in technology. This is increasingly becoming a concern for everyone in the ecosystem. We're having these very sophisticated political, um, local, and then of course interrelated military and technology conversations, and that's becoming part of doing business as a company anywhere now. Um, and the harmonization of laws, or I should say lack thereof, you're having to do business in every single country in, in a very different way. And that's just, I think, maybe a sign of the times, maybe something we've got, gone through in the past, but it's, it's definitely a, a conversation that requires a lot of senior leadership inside companies to, to understand how sophisticated those conversations are. So I'd say that's one point. Um, another is really, I think, what, what Mark said a little bit, I say it in a different way, which is the digital transformation that, that governments are coming to realize, and frankly, even big enterprises are realizing to fulfill my mission or business needs, I have to radically transform how I use technology to get it done. 
and we're continuing to enable that. But it's really, I mean, all, all the different dynamics across the businesses are changing and we're helping to empower that. And that's really a truly unique place to be. And it's an interesting conversation. And then lastly, I would say um, it's an, you know, a, a version of what Katie said at the end, which is scale. The f making decisions now and trying to be in charge of big security conversations in cloud, um, having to deal with devices that are you know, changing vendors. You have 15 different devices on your network. You've got to deal with infrastructure, apps, and data. Then you have all these other um, rich data conversations you're having because everything is talking to you, and you're having to interpret that and make decisions. That's truly a unique place in history where um, people are making big decisions, small decisions, the consumers, enterprises, and we're trying to help enable a, a, a better decision, a more frank decision, but it's a challenge and something we have to think about. Great. Well, if the audience will thank me and join the panel, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. We will have a second panel uh, starting in about five minutes on the role of the tech titans and, and uh, working with government um, and, on, and assisting government. And then at the end of the panels, we'll have a, a reception outside with, uh, with drinks, so please stick around for that. So uh, if the next panel can come on up.
Thanks, everyone. We're going to begin again in just a minute. Thanks again uh, for being here. Uh, my name is Matthew Hyman. I wear a couple of different hats. Uh, so I'm a senior fellow at the National Security Institute uh, at George Mason University. I chair the Cyber and Privacy Working Group, which is part of the Regulatory Transparency Project. And I also chair the International and National Security Law Practice Group at the Federalist Society. And so I would like to begin by thanking Hoover for hosting us. Uh, and then both the Federalist Society and the National Security Institute for sponsoring this. I'd also like to thank uh, some of the students uh, that are associated with Federalist Society student chapters, uh, both here and at Berkeley, for helping us organize the event and doing a lot of the legwork, which, which helped brought uh, the panelists together. So uh, really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel. And, and just as a reminder, the second panel is really focused on the interaction between the tech titans in the government, particularly in the context of investigations, be they criminal intelligence or otherwise. Uh, and we've got a very distinguished panel, and I'm delighted they agreed to uh, join us. So uh, just as we go down the line here, uh, first is Matt Olson. Uh, Matt is the Chief Trust and Security Officer at Uber Technologies. Uh, prior to that, Matt uh, had a long and distinguished career with the federal government. Uh, during the Obama administration, he was the director of the Na uh, National Counterterrorism Center. Um, he was also the general counsel at the National Security Agency, and uh, he was the associate deputy attorney general covering national security matters at the Department of Justice. Uh, a little further down the panel, uh, Ted Oliot, he's the former general counsel at Facebook. He's the former chief of staff to the attorney general of the Department of Justice. He was an associate counsel at the White House, and he was also a senior member of the legal department at AOL Time Warner. And our last panelist, uh, John Yu, is the Emanuel Heller Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley. He's also a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, a lot of Professor Yu's uh, research and academic work focuses on national security topics, particularly as they intersect with the Constitution. Uh, he was a DOJ official at the Office of Legal Counsel, and he was also the general counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee. So um, obviously, uh, everyone on this panel has both uh, government experience and experience outside the government. And I thought we'd begin um, the discussion by uh, dispensing with opening statements from each panelist and just um, talking about this topic. And, and if, if I could take a minute to set the context, this idea of the federal government working with the private sector uh, when it comes to intelligence and criminal investigations is nothing new. Um, it's been going on since uh, there, was an, there was a private sector and there was a government. Um, and if we think about 20th century history, um, even post-World War II, there was a strong interaction between uh, the government and the private sector when it came to signals intelligence um, if you look there, uh, you know, post-World War II, there were um, both well-known and in some cases infamous examples of this. You think of things like Project Shamrock, where uh, the government was collecting essentially all telegraph information from Western Union. Um, the government worked very closely with the Bell systems to collect uh, information as it needed to support both criminal and intelligence investigations. So I think in, in a lot of sense, um, this panel is talking about where are we today and where are we going, uh, but it obviously reflects the change in technology, whether we talk about, you know, when we talk about usage of the internet as the major way that people connect with each other. So the first uh, question I would pose, uh, and that's to Professor Yu, is kind of a framing issue, is when we talk about government requests for assistance, um, whether to support criminal or intelligence matters, you know, what are the limits of those requests from perhaps a constitutional or statutory perspective? And I was hoping, uh, Professor Yu, you could help us you know, think about where are those meets and bounds. Sure. First, I, I want to say uh, thank you to the Federal Society 
for uh, helping uh, organize and inspiring this panel and <clears throat> to the Hoover Institution for, uh, you forgot to mention, for giving me a job. <laughs> so I'm a, a, I'm a visiting fellow here and it's a, it's a great uh, place to have uh, conferences like this that bring the intersection of uh, academic disciplines together but in a way uh, where we discuss real world uh, problems, which we don't do a lot of at Berkeley. Um, so I'm so happy to be here and doing this at Hoover. So um, I think you nicely set it out. If the question is, um, what's the legal, broader legal questions that go to um, companies and how they have to assist? And this is kind of where we really think about this in terms of what I think of as cyber defense. Someone tries to hack us, some tr tries to attack us, and the government tries to respond or tries to prevent that from happening, and they call on Facebook or Uber or uh, Google, other companies, Twitter, to help in that. <clears throat> and the way you set it out, Matt, I think is, is good because I think there's still a dichotomy in uh, how we think about it in law and how the public thinks about it. And sometimes we think about it as a crime. So think about the hack of Sony by probably North Korea. You know, we, talk, we didn't talk about deterrence and retaliation. We talked about holding the people responsible. And it was an attack on a private company. Right? It wasn't an attack on a government installation or facility. We tend to think about that as crime. But then when we think of uh, China hacking the, uh, the, person, the, the US government personnel database, uh, which uh, is an incredible uh, coup for them as an intelligence matter. They have access to the, uh, all of our uh, national security background files, which we're not even allowed to see. Right, so if I want to see my own background, if I have to go to downtown Beijing and buy it in a market for five dollars, <laughs> I, I am not actually legally allowed to see it myself in the United States. Right, it's incredible how much information as an intelligence was lost. We tend to think of that as an intelligence slash war issue, and the the powers the government has in those two areas are very different because of the different kinds of rights at stake. So when it comes to crime, as you said, Matt, that's been going on a long time very settled framework on how to handle that rooted in the Fourth Amendment, and you need a warrant and with specificity. You have to have probable cause that a crime occurred. You name the targets uh, by name specifically, and a judge approves it, and then you have the authority under that to go to the companies and ask for that information. The things which I think are nebulous and which we have to figure out as we're going forward, 9-11 just started us thinking about it, but more in the context of terrorism than against cyber, is what do you do for intelligence and war where we didn't have a very well-developed framework about rights, and we didn't really have a very well-developed framework in terms of what the government's powers were. And so the, there is this limit, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which we're all learning about because of uh, Russia's alleged interference in the elections, um, but there's a lot more authorities than that. And uh, things that we do in war commonly uh, we would never do in criminal matters. So for just take one example, if we thought that China had undertaken a hack against us and they had already succeeded, what would we normally do in the national security world to stop them? We would do something of equal harm to them as a deterrent. Uh, we don't do that in the criminal justice system, right? We don't think about inflicting harm on you know, a likely suspect <laughs> to get them to stop. We try to arrest them and stop them. But in this military intelligence area, we have to do a lot more, which also, so I think that calls on us to think about, uh, in ways I don't think we've really definitively come to a settlement. The courts have really never ruled on this, which is what kind of legal frame we're gonna have with government powers, and then are we gonna have the same notion of rights? Are we gonna import it from the criminal justice system, or are we gonna have a different one that's more rooted in older notions when we would allow the government to intercept every telegram and telegraph leaving the country because there was not thought to be rights at stake uh, when it was uh, World War II or World War I approaching. Thanks. Um, Ted, when we think about that role, so in putting yourself in your old shoes as the general counsel for Facebook uh -huh. um, and Uncle Sam comes knocking, and in the case of Facebook, it's probably knocking thousands of times a day for pieces of data, what kind of burdens is the company having to deal with? How is the company thinking about um, that relationship when you know you are you know being required or requested to provide that routine assistance day in day out? Great, thanks, Matthew. Uh, a couple of thoughts on that. And first, like John, I would like to thank 
uh, Hoover and the Federalist Society, and especially the NSI at the Antonin Scalia School of Law at George Mason. Yeah, I'm so great to hear that and to be able to call that law school the Scalia Law School. So great to be here, and, and thanks to all of you for putting this on. Um, for, yeah, from the company's perspective, you know, it, um, you know I think it, it, if you start with the, even the description of the panel here, which I really like, great, great description, the way John laid this out, I think all of us up here will tend to think about ways in which government and the companies can work together and what the companies can do to help a general mission of keeping the platform secure, keeping the country secure, keeping users secure even, avoiding misuse of platforms. But I think a theme you'll hear me come back to again and again today is that from the company's perspective, it's very, it's, there's a whole different angle on this problem. And I think one, thing, one way to start with it is Yahoo and the congressional hearing in 2007. Right, with, which was when Yahoo had complied with a Chinese government request for data about a Chinese journalist. And they could comply with that because they had presence in China. They were subject to Chinese law. They turned over the information, and this ended up, the, the, he ended up being identified as a dissident and jailed and tortured. And then there was this hearing in 2007 where Jerry Yang and the general, the CEO of, of, uh, of Yahoo and the, and the general counsel, great guy, Mike Callahan, who's here at the Rock Center at Stanford now, where they testified before Congress, and Congressman Lantos just ripped them. Just how could you do this? The mother of the jailed Chinese journalist was, was sitting behind them. Lantos made them get up and turn around and apologize. So that is, that episode is seared in the minds of all, you, know, you, you probably think about this now, Matt, uh, but, but it's, it's seared in the mind of all companies in Silicon Valley, probably all companies anywhere that, that maintain significant user data. So there's that concern about protecting users and the, and, while we may have, while a company may have these duties under law and moral duties, as this says, you know, as the description says here, as corporate citizens, to what extent should companies cooperate and assist government in these investigations? You do have those duties, but there's this major one that's a countervailing concern for the companies. And so that episode, no one wants to be up there in front of Congress having given over information in some questionable circumstances that ends up harming a user in an, ex in an extreme way or even in a non-extreme way. But that's, that is a big concern of the companies and so that weighs on the mind. And so when a company gets a request for a government request for data, US or others, um, US government or other government, that is something that's very much on the mind. We need to comply, we're gonna comply, but what can we do you know, how can we protect our users? And one way that played out, and Matt, you, uh, you, you know, I've actually re had occasion recently to read the case, but, but subsequently, I think because Yahoo had been in that situation in 2007, in 2000, probably later in 07, when Yahoo was served, it's now, we didn't know at the time, but we now know it was Yahoo as a sealed order for many years. But the Justice Department served a, what was then a Protect America Act request for user data on Yahoo. American government served this, and this is pursuant to statute, served that on Yahoo. Yahoo fought that. There's the US government, 2007, late Bush, second term. Yahoo fought that, challenged it, refused to comply. Matt and colleagues at the Justice Department at the time had to, had to go in and move the court to comply with that order to force Yahoo to give up the data. Ultimately, you prevailed, and Yahoo turned over the data, um, and that was the first major challenge of Protect America Act, later 702, but, and that sort of set that framework, but that Yahoo, once that became public, that Yahoo done that, Yahoo was hailed in Silicon Valley, hailed for standing up for users, and this is not the Chinese government, but the American government, pursuant to a, congress, to a statute that had been passed by overwhelming bipartisan margins, and uh, had been fully debated, of course, in Congress. And then the, the Justice Department comes to use that to get information. Yahoo fights that, and Yahoo is cheered by Silicon Valley. Very different than what we have here about, oh, hey, we've got a duty as corporate citizens to help identify bad guys and turn over 
turnover data. So that's a very strong feeling out here. Yeah. And, and Matt, just dovetailing off of that, um, you're with Uber today. Uh, I, I'm assuming that Uber gets requests for assistance from the U.S. government as well as governments around the world. How do you and Uber's senior management think about that tension that Ted was talking about between whether you call it corporate citizenship or just complying with a, a valid legal order and then the obligations you might have to your customers in terms of their expectations of privacy and how their data is being handled? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's a really good question, a really good way to think about the, the challenge that whether it's Uber, uh, Facebook, or, you know, any number of, of companies might might think about when when faced with a request for government information. This this question about you know there's the the corporate citizenship or or the or the lawful request, and then on the other hand, um, you know the privacy uh, and expectations of our users. And I think you know your your anecdote, Ted, about Yahoo is I, I agree is a was sort of a, a real milestone mm -hmm. here. But the, I think it's useful kind of to step back and realize that this tension this goes back to Ben Franklin, right? I mean, this is not a new problem. Um, trying to balance uh, liberty and security, and uh, my my sort of sort of speaking from a personal perspective, my first sort of exposure to this was as a prosecutor in Washington D.C. working on murder cases, and you know we would have a we would have a murder, and we would have a potential suspect, and one of our first steps when you had a suspect uh, and a and a and a dead body was to find out you know about that suspect's use of the phone around the time of the murder. And it was a routine matter, right, to request telephone records, cell phone records uh, from a defendant uh, and, 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 and with a subpoena. So, you know, trying to get information from a company uh, to solve a crime, you know, under the Fourth Amendment and under the rules of, of criminal procedure, uh, and those rules and those and those uh, policies, regulations are very well established when it comes to U.S. criminal context. To your point, Professor, right? That's that's where it's pretty straightforward and pretty pretty easy. But the hard part gets to uh, the when we're talking about global companies, uh, global technology companies, and and really, I think it's useful to think about. Uh, where we are, I think your dichotomy between sort of the intelligence, national security realm, and, and the criminal law enforcement realm, and how we're trying to reconcile those two, um, those the, those two realms. Uh, FISA was one effort to do that. Was an effort to bring the government within the confines of a of a sort of of a judicial process when it comes to gathering intelligence to, focused on people in the United States. But we're still struggling with how to deal with that. Uh, the, the collection of information when it comes to um, uh, uh, foreign intelligence targets, particularly outside the United States. And that was what the FISA, uh, uh -huh. uh, Protect America Act and the FISA amendments of, of 2008 uh, and 702 were all about. Um, so I think, you know, I guess I, from my perspective, I guess the broader point is this, t this challenge, whether it's as a, as a company, um, as, a, as a citizen, as the government, in trying to identify how to reconcile uh, security and, and privacy? The, the short answer is, when it comes to standard cases, the law helps us do that, right? The law is the effort to, to strike that right balance. But so often, particularly in the intelligence and national security context, we're dealing with areas where the, the, the rules are less clear, the rules are changing, technology is changing, and that makes it, you know, that makes it both uh, challenging, but I'll, I'll, honestly, as, a, as myself now a recovering lawyer, I'm not a practicing lawyer, I'm getting better, <laughs> but um, I, you know, it makes it very fun and, and exciting to, to work in this area. John, I just want to make uh, one point of reaction to both of you and ask you <clears throat> a, a question is, uh, I think it's certainly right that there's always been a tension between security and liberty, but I do think there's something different about the new technology world uh, as an outsider. I've never worked inside either of these companies. I wish I had, because then I wouldn't be poor. <laughs> I've never worked on the inside of these companies. I don't know how they think. But, um, you know, in pa the, the thing that's different is that they are global in scope and they provide an intangible, non-physical product mm -hmm. for the most part, um, which is wanted and bought and sold all over the world. And so the thing that strikes me as different in the past is, uh, it used to be like, to me, the deal of war and nations was, we would protect you if you were an American company. You're on our territory. 
And so you know, if someone were to attack you, that would be an attack on the United States as a nation, and we will protect you. And then the deal was, but then that nation would call on you to support the nation at war. So uh, the thing, you know, so you know, if there's an oil company or a armaments company, you know, any co company that was attacked from abroad, we would consider an attack on the United States. But that doesn't seem to be going on anymore. You, know, you read about these cyber attacks on American companies, and it doesn't even seem like the government sometimes thinks it's their job to protect the companies or respond. So that's being disassociated. And then the other, on the other side, uh, sometimes you get the experience when you read about comp uh, high tech companies being asked for assistance. They think of it, oh well, th now the United States government's asking us for something, and now the Chinese government's asking. For the United States government doesn't get any kind of precedence over that in their request for assistance. Uh, so sometimes I think they don't think of themselves as American companies, they think of themselves as global companies and just every nation is just asking it for stuff. They don't necessarily feel loyalty to any one country or another. And that means that there's, that's also part of the deal. Uh, nation states and security that also seems to have broken down, but it's just outsider perspective. You think that's accurate or? I think that's absolutely right. And that it was an interesting take on it. Um, and a couple of reactions. One is I think part of the resistance that you get at the companies to or the, the unease, let's say, even if they end up complying, but the unease or the lack of enthusiasm for compliance with lawful orders relates one of one piece is what you're talking about, John, which is wow, at Facebook, if you have two billion monthly active users, you know, ninety what by the math, ninety-five percent are outside the US. Um so Yes, we may be headquartered in Menlo Park, and most of our servers are in the U.S. Not all, but most are in the U.S. Um, but geez, that's a lot of foreign data, for, data of users who are foreigners. And why should the why should the U.S. government have a have have an ability to get this? Why should we cooperate with them more? Um, and and. Um, in addition, I'd say there's separate from that feeling of that spirit of internationality, as it were, or this global citizenship, there is a hostility in today's you know, employee base at many companies, and I'll certainly say this is true in my time, hostility, skepticism toward the US government in particular. And I don't know, you know we could figure out where that comes from. Um, too many movies, right? Too many movies. Too many bad, bad headlines here and there. Um, but, um, but that certainly is that's a, that's an issue. And, and it's interesting. It's always that's always been very interesting to me that you find that in Silicon Valley. And I think it goes to John. Maybe that bargain you were talking about with the older companies you know, is we all know. I think in this room, Silicon Valley technology is really built in its infancy on cooperation with the government. Yeah. And cooperation and plenty of, you know, DARPA, the internet for crying out loud, is, you know, a, a, it's a government military project to begin with. And it's I thought Al Gore did it. Yeah, exactly. you know, <laughs> later, that was phase yeah. two, right? <laughs> um, but, it, but that was their uh, Fairchild Semiconductor. You know, all the giants of the early Silicon Valley were companies that actually had a lot to do with government and did not shrink from engagement with the government and actually welcomed it, welcomed government dollars. Today, it's very different. We can you know, set aside Facebook. We can talk about the Snowden episode. You know, that's I mean, Facebook. We can talk about all that. But even taking away from Facebook, you had the Google thing recently with Project Maven, right? With the drone, with AI for better facial identification, drones, ideally to make it safer. And if you're going to use it for taking out bad people, make sure you're taking out the right bad people and not the good people. Um, and then, so I think it was Project Maven that was, and then there was this episode at Twitter, which is the very strange one, but, but show, demonstrates this feeling among engineers and among employees out here. This was, the company I think was called Data Miner, and was a company that you know, used, by definition, open source, you know, analysis of open source and out in the open tweets, aggregated those to give information. The CIA was a client of Data Miner, Twitter found this out. Again, this is public information. These are tweets people are making. Data miner aggregates those, takes information, gives it to the CIA. Oh, there's, you know, there's a crop failure in this part of the world. There's an insurrection over here. Um, when Twitter found that out, they barred data miner from providing that information to the CIA. Why? I mean, it's, it, you know, it, it shows a sentiment here in the valley, I think, that's puzzling. 
Yeah, and one would think, just to comment on that, that if the CIA had failed to try and aggregate and use that information, it would also be criticized if something went wrong and it was knowable by looking at public tweets. Right, right. So it's... It, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with that as well and had some of the reaction as, as you do, Ted. I mean, the, 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 again, I'll take a sort of a step back because I was in the government during the time of the Snowden revelation, so in 2013, and um, having worked at NSA before then, uh, you know, obviously was sort of familiar with the programs that were revealed during that, and I, and I, and I think there there has been a you know over the course of the past, right in the immediate aftermath of the Snowden revelations, um, a, a loss of of trust um, at, at a number of levels, you know, with the with the intelligence community and. And to some degree, the American people, um, international partners, um, but but I think some of those you know those domains, the trust has over time been rebuilt. If you look at polling data and you look at our relationship with partners around the world, the R being when I say R, when I, I should be clear, not really R anymore for me. The intelligence communities, relationships, those have been rebuilt. I think that the, the trust with the with the, the technology community here still has a ways to go. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think there's been progress made over the past couple years in rebuilding that sense of trust, um, but it's it's incumbent on the government as well as on the, on, the, on the technology community, I think, to try to rebuild that trust and to to find um, to mend uh, you know rebuild the bridges that allowed for a degree of of um, you know transparency and cooperation for the same reasons that you know you look back at, as you point out, Ted, to sort of the the the, the degree of collaboration that led to the development of the internet and a whole number of innovations and, and technological breakthroughs through cooperation between the public sector and the private sector. It's really through, I, my view is it's through the, that level of cooperation that we're going to help solve, for example, the challenge we faced in cybersecurity, um, and particularly when it comes to nation state actors. So mm -hmm. I look to that trust as being a key piece of, of rebuilding um, our capabilities at, because it's so important to get the level of, of cooperation between the government and, and the technology sector. That's for the reasons I think you said, or those in, in, instances you cite, Ted, I think is missing to some degree today. So John, a lot of our conversation thus far has been in the context of the US government coming to a, a large company and saying, we need this information about person X, or we need access to communications from this category. Um, but what about um, enlisting companies to help the U.S. government in a more offensive capacity? So again, if we talk about in the realm, if we think about the realm of cyber, um, if the U.S. government does not have an internal capacity, but perhaps a corporate actor does, how does, you know, what kind of legal bounds are out there in terms of a government coming to that company saying, we need to do this to either this nation state or this group that is causing harm to the U.S., uh, we'd like to enlist your help. I mean, how would that work? Could that work? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an inter interesting question, and uh, you know, we have a number of people from Hoover who are from the military uh, departments and agencies and forces, and they, they would tell you, I think, if you read what they write about this, is uh, they think about it very differently than we do as lawyers. So as lawyers, we think of it like crimes. You know, something bad happens to us. We react after it's happened. We find out who did it using forensic high-tech tools, and then we hold them responsible. Um, but if you look at st uh, strategic writing about this, you know, you say, who are our opponents? And so China and Russia right now, not rivals, whatever we call them. There are rivals. Uh, the strategy would be, uh, you know, what is our goal? And pretty much our goal is around the world we're trying to maintain the status quo. We're not trying to, you know, we're trying to revise it. China and Russia are trying, what we call revisionist powers. They're trying to change the balance of power, change uh, the rules in different parts of the world. Uh, what are they doing? The cyber is part of a broader strategy they're using against the United States to try to make the world the way they want it. The thing about uh, cyber as a weapon that's different uh, in some ways. Actually, the weirdest thing is that the closest thing to it is nuclear weapons, which would seem to be the other end of the spectrum, is that um, the really defining characteristic about cyber techniques is that offense is really cheap. It's very easy and cheap to do a lot of offense. 
and defense is super expensive and probably not foolproof, right? I mean, these companies are putting enormous investments into defense, cyber defense, and they're still hacks and succeeding because of that difference. It's the same thing with nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are extremely cheap, easy to build and use. Defense is almost impossible to have 100% and extremely expensive. So what is the main strategic answer to cyber is the threat of being able to do offense yourself, right? You use deterrence when you have that kind of imbalance between costs and benefits, offense and defense, the main way you prevent attacks on yourself is the threat of doing it to the other side, deterrence through offensive action. And that, I think, is a good one because legally we have not thought about that much at all. How would the government ask corporations, which are global, to help it use for cyber force against another country? Uh, I could see why companies would be extremely reluctant to ever do that. But it may be that that's the most effective way and maybe even the least destructive way for the United States to exercise deterrence on the country. So some people have talked about letters of mark and reprisal because one thing companies would be worried about would be liability right. for doing something like that. And they might not just be worried about US liability, they would be worried about liability under other legal systems. Could there be a way that the United States, we would have, this is something new that we have to develop and actually things like this are the places to figure out what those rules are gonna be in order to try to, because otherwise, uh, you know, the United States government can only do through much so through the NSA. I can't see how you couldn't be effective unless you had some of the capabilities that really are in the hands of private companies uh, to do that. So just to play out this um, hypothetical, uh, so the, you know, name the person, the, the director of the NSA, the secretary of defense uh, is in the lobby at Uber or <laughs> Facebook and uh, needs to talk to you about a very hush-hush request and is presumably tried to contact your CEO. And if you're an effective GC, you've very quickly gotten involved in that dialogue. And so they're coming up to your conference room because, you know, Uber has a special sauce or Facebook has a special sauce and they want to do something that's critical to national security. Um, there's no clear legal guidance yet because Professor Yu hasn't written the treatise on it. <laughs> and I'm not working in government again, so I'm not doing it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's no clear legal guidance on this, which, you know, is what a lot of general counsels love is something that's kind of gray and you get to use your, your mind to think about what the answer should be. But what are some of the questions you're kind of rolling through in your head, what are some of the questions you're putting to that government official that may be saying, we really need your help because you're the only entity that can do X or Y? I, you know, Ted or Matt, you, either order. Who wants to go first? I, I mean, I think it's, that's a, if there's no clear legal authority, that's gonna be probably the end of the discussion in today's climate. Um, and one example of this is the encryption debate. Right, and the San Bernardino episode where there you have, um, you know, this is the Apple episode where the FBI, the Bureau wanted to have access to the phones of, I, I think, two dead terrorists mm -hmm. at that point to see if there, this is part of a larger plot. And um, there, that's, that's actually, that is an example of this because there is no clear legal authority about whether you can make but you can require Apple engineers to work, to go to work for you to break into something that is encrypted and to, to, to use tools that had not yet been, as Apple claimed, tools that had not been devised yet by Apple to, you know, to go ahead and tweak the tools that they had to make it, make it possible to open up the phones. It, it, ends up, it ends up being litigated, Apple litigates this, and then it ends up being mooted because the, the FBI finds some way, as yet unknown. As usual, we ask the Israelis to do that. The Israelis reported because <laughs> they can do everything. Israelis say, "Yeah, we'll do this." Um, got it done, cracked it. Um, Apple's patching that hole now, probably. Um, but I think it's going to be a very short discussion, and I think that's a good illustration of that. Matt, or yeah, do, no, do, I, I totally do they get agree. to even have a cookie in your conference room before no, you boot I, them I, out, I think or? that's right. I mean, I, I think the encryption debate, I think the, the Yahoo example is another where having, I lived through that as, a, as representing the, the, the Justice Department where even with um, a clearly valid order, but, but one that was novel, had just mm -hmm. been, uh, was, subject, you know, was implementing a brand new statute, um, 
the, the company, you know, within its rights litigated that. And, you know, in some ways that process is a, is a, is a healthy process, right? I mean, not in, in all ways it's a healthy process with the exception that it slowed us down a bit, but it, it did lead to um, clarifying the rules. It led to the company feeling more comfortable. You know, certainly it was on very firm legal footing after receiving a, an order from a judge interpreting our order. Um, so, but that's an example, I think, of how even, you know, in that climate then and today with the encryption debate, you know, companies are going to look for clear and, and well-founded legal requirements um, in that context. I do think one thing that makes that hypothetical even more interesting, perhaps, is that so much of the, uh, of the victims in a, in a cyber scenario are the private sector, right? It's really the private sector that's bearing the brunt of cyber attacks. It's not the government. Uh, I mean, the government has its share of cyber attacks, but it's the private sector, by and large, that's bearing the brunt. So the, you know, the question becomes more interesting when you think about, okay, what role should the private sector then have in enabling the government to respond? Because where the, author the authority for responding offensively is squarely within the government's remit and not the private sector. So, um, so what role should a company have? For example, if a company were hacked and the government says, okay, we, we want to help understand, we want to make you, you know, basically we want to retaliate, but the only way to do so is for you, you the victim company, to help us, um, where the company's incentive might be particularly high. Yeah. Even in that context, I still think that there's the, the company, even as the victim, is still going to look for very clear legal um, you know, a legal requirement or legal support for enabling the government to take any offensive action. Yeah. I think a, a tougher hypo would be, I don't think it's a hypo, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, like when you talk about FISA and need to get warrants for, again, it's for things that happened already. Mm -hmm. yes. Suppose you're a tech company and you- the Jack Bowers in your- <laughs> Yeah, right, so uh, his name was Fred actually. No, <laughs> so suppose you're a tech company and you're aware of certain kinds of vulnerabilities in other countries. And you said, oh, look, we've noticed that Kim Jong-un uses this commu private communications messaging app to talk to agents abroad for North Korea. And we noticed it in our systems that that's what they're doing. Uh, it's From what you say, the companies are not going to voluntarily provide that to the United States. There probably is no way you could get a legal order to force them because it's not about protecting from a crime. Nothing's happened. And yet at the same time, this would be enormously right, valuable to our intelligence agencies and could produce great gains for a peaceful resolution, hopefully. But legally, I don't think, unless the company, and this is the story of World War I, World War II, unless the companies voluntarily mm -hmm. right, cooperate with the government out of some idea of patriotism, there's no legal authority to force them to hand it over, it sounds like. And, and the companies would not comply, and they would fight it in court if they had to. Does that sound right? I think they'd fight it, and I think the only scenario <clears throat> where they might not fight that and they might be willing to do it is what you say, Matt, which is if these, if this company was part of a group of five companies that was specifically being targeted by the foreign actor. <laughs> so if you said, okay, hey, North Korea is coming in your own after benefit. us. Yeah, it's, it's your own it's, benefit. This is good for national security. It's, it's also, also good for your good company. For and yeah. for our users. Yeah, right. Do you think Sony might have been more receptive if Uncle Sam had shown up before all the emails spilled out into the public? Yes. Yeah, but, the, but foreign it's, governments, and they're using WhatsApp, right? They're, they're very, you know, very secure communication systems. They're offered by our companies. And, you know, they're using them just like our own citizens use them. It wouldn't be of any, it would be, it would be very bad for WhatsApp's business model if they, right, got news got out that they had cooperated with the government. Right? Right. So they, yeah. they would not be... The ones who would help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, if we if, if we talk about the, and and I think Ted, you you mentioned this about sort of the resistance among employees at tech companies to cooperate with the government. Um, for, you know, from your experience, from from living in in California, um, where is that? Is that opposition just simply the fact that we're in a a, a blue state and blue state folks tend to be more focused on civil liberties and a sense of privacy or is there something more inherent to that and and can you talk about how that affects management and boardroom thinking which you know management is obviously in a lot of these for many of these tech companies sitting here in California and so can you talk about kind of that the culture within the company around that feeling of you know, whether or not you work with the government and how, how cooperative you're going to be? 
Yeah, I can talk, I can, of course, speak from experience on one company, but I do right. think it translates pretty well across the board here. And I, it's a great question to try to figure out where this came from and where this shift of mindset comes from. And um, I, I don't have great, great views on, I don't have great insight on that. I'd say I just know what the end result is, which is an employee base that is very nervous about uh, being perceived as cooperating again, especially with the U.S. government. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's an if that's an age thing, you know, given that most of the engineers are younger and um, uh, and, and maybe have not. You know, they've seen only one cycle, and and in particular when I was there, which is you know 08 through 2013, Snowden actually have it in my last couple months at the company. Uh, may and there, you know, the main most engineers are coming out of the bush years and you know bad people like you and me and <laughs> Matt not one of them but you know just sort of people who are you know um, portrayed portrayed one way and they have this vision of of you know what government officials are and what what the you know what what sorts of requests government makes so I don't know the roots of it but in terms of your actual your practical questions to how this plays out look at the end of the day you have to comply with lawful orders. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? You can challenge it like Yahoo did with the uh, Protect America Act subpoena um, or order. Uh, you can challenge it, and that works once. And if you keep, you know, and then and, and you're, you know, the, then when you lose that, the, you 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 have to comply. And then if they come in in the future with one that we are raising the same legal argument, you will be held in contempt if you keep failing to comply with that. And as other comp other companies can read the then redacted order and say, wow, okay, a company, I don't know who it was, already challenged this. And the court, it went all the way up to the FISA, what do we call it, the Court of Appeal, right? The FISA Court of Appeal, whatever the formal name of that is. But you go all the way up there and, okay, they upheld that order, so we have to comply. So you have to comply. Similarly, even with with orders of foreign of foreign governments, you know, if you... It, if, if you if you don't have any facilities or any employees there, the the ability of that government to coerce compliance is pretty low. Although your executives probably should not travel to that country in the future, but but they, there's no actual in the moment le leverage that that country has. So you can be a little more mm -hmm. resistant to you know a Vietnamese order if you're not yet in Vietnam and you have no contractors, nobody in Vietnam. But if you're in the UK, if you're in Germany, if you're in Brazil, if you're in India, to name a few who are very aggressive in using process and seeking user data, you don't have any choice. So you, I think that's the challenge. Knowing that your employee base is doesn't like this, uh, they don't may not know all the details of that you know, Brazil is making these requests. Um, knowing they don't like that, you, you have to comply. And as the legal department, you have to make sure you comply with your legal obligations, and this is now a legal obligation. The board usually gets that. The board is quite experienced. They understand that, and they, they might say, well, you figure out how to convey that to the employees. Um, but it's, it's, it's tough, and I think you, know, you probably look for opportunities um, that'll be... Uh, they'll be in in silence at first, opportunities to challenge these orders, mm -hmm. so that then when a Snowden article comes out, you can say, aha, yeah, but we fought this as far as we could. And we are only we only complied because we we're absolutely forced to by the courts. If you have a problem, go talk to the courts about this. That's probably what you do. You look for a few opportunities like that to challenge orders, even if they're lawful orders, but there's not much more you can do yeah. than that. And so yeah, go, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting question. I, and I, have, I think about this partly because I, I still have, I'm relatively new to, to my position here and, and have spent most of my career in the government and, and in, the, in the Washington, D.C. area. So this sort of is question of culture, and is, I think it's fascinating. Um, I think for, from my perspective at Uber, we have a slightly you know, different um, set of circumstances, partly because Uber is not, it, it is a technology company based here, but it's also a company that has physical, to your point, Ted, physical uh, presence in hundreds of cities around the world. Um, and 20 plus thousand employees, many of them around the world. And we, as a, I think, <clears throat> as a company from the top, um, understands that there is going to be, there are going to be 
instances where law enforcement in sort of relatively straightforward and mundane circumstances are going to want to seek access to information we have about a, a, a crime that was committed perhaps involving uh, somebody who's connected to our platform, right? So um, uh, we, we have actually set up a very uh, efficient and robust law enforcement response team uh, that is in a position to respond to lawful orders, whether here in the United States or around the world, to provide, when we have a lawful basis, uh, a lawful request, to provide information to assist law enforcement. It, we feel like it's kind of, you know, it's, it's part of our commitment to the cities in which we are present to be a, you know, a, a solid um, and, and responsible member of that community so that when we have information that can be helpful and we have a lawful order, we, we have a, a system and a mechanism and 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 and, and uh, a, a process to provide that information. We do have privacy policies and principles that we apply um, because not every country is like the United States in terms of the you know the sort of robustness of the of the process. But I think that's a I think that's actually in our culture at Uber as as, as I've seen it. Um, and and you know as an example, something that's on our website is a, is a discussion of of cooperation that we engaged in. Following in London, following the in 2017, the London Bridge uh, terror attack, where we worked closely and and very quickly with the Metropolitan Police in London to provide information that allowed them to identify two witnesses. Uh, we enabled a search for potential uh, uh, video that would have come from a, a dash camera for uh, a dashboard camera, for example. So. Close cooperation with the Metropolitan Police and and in the aftermath of a significant you know tragic terrorist attack, that we think is you know a, a positive aspect of of what we can do uh, to support law enforcement in the communities where we're we're operating. And uh, I just wanted to make sure the audience knew we're going to reserve some time at the end uh, for some Q and A. I've just got another question or two for the panel, so please start thinking about your questions, and we'll make sure we get a mic to you. Um, comment on Matt's. I, I think that's what that is going to is very, you know, what you're talking about of publicizing this seemingly wildly popular use of Uber's or instance of Uber sharing data with the government. I think that is that's another tool you can do in addition to looking for opportunities to challenge orders that right. seem overbroad. You, you you show the good you, you show the good side of this, um, because there's this pendulum invariably in society, in Congress, and probably at the companies as well. You swing back and forth between security as the primary concern on September 12, 2001, and then as that wanes, then privacy becomes a concern. And you know, it's, it's rarely in the sweet spot in the middle. It's you know, whipping back and forth. Um, John was actually at justice uh, on 9-11. Um, but if you can look for these opportunities, we try to do that on a, that's a great example. I imagine that was wildly popular among the employee base who said, right on, you know, we, we helped get these terrorists um, and your users. And I would think it would similarly be popular at all companies. Um, we, we, did, we try to do a similar thing in the wake yep. of Snowden when we, you know, that was, we can spend an hour on, on the Snowden episode, but ultimately one thing that with the help of, you know, Matt and his colleagues, I was at the company at the time, but one of the keys we wanted to get out was, you know, what this actually was, that this was mm -hmm. 702, these are 702 orders, it's, you know, nothing unusual, nothing, you know, something that, again, was over, passed overwhelmingly, and, but one of the key, so we put out this post, this blog post um, that talked about how few data requests globally a company like Facebook receives. So we talked about six months increments, and that's kind of the standard in these so-called transparency reports. So we put out a transparency report, and we were we got the first permission from the government to include in our numbers national security-related requests, which formerly could not be included in that overall number. And so we were eager to get this out because in a six-month period, you know, there's this vision in the Snowden stories that there was this big pipe going in from NSA into the servers of the companies, and we want to say no, and, and we you know, we got the permission to disclose this that in a six month period, um, worldwide at the time 1.2 billion monthly active users, six month period, the total number of law enforcement government government requests of any kind, law enforcement intelligence, you name it, worldwide 
1.2 billion monthly ad users was between eight and 9,000, mm -hmm. very small, covering, I think, 18 to 20,000 users. Again, so I don't know what the fraction there is. I'm a lawyer, not a you know, recovering lawyer, not a mathematician, but that's a very small fraction of the user base. And we want to get that out. So we got that number out, trying to tell the story. And the other thing we tried to do on this, this education was say, we're talking about everything from the sheriff trying to track down a missing child in Omaha, right? To the, right. To the you know, state trooper trying to break up a meth lab in you know, Ohio, to, um, you know, to, the, you know, to an intelligence request. This includes everything. And then right. by pointing out these scenarios, oh, who wouldn't want us to be helpful in finding a lost child? Yeah. Right. I think that's one piece you can do. Um, and just along those lines, I'm, since you're all, we all are alums of the Department of Justice, and we are, none of us are with the Department of Justice these days, um, when we're not at one of those inflection points in terms of what you might think of as maximal cooperation between private sector and the government, and, you know, historic examples of that were World War II, obviously, where, you know, the private sector works hand in glove with the U.S. government to be the, you know, the engine of democracy, um, in terms of creating armaments and, you know, the big three automobile companies were making tanks and ships. Uh, or even post 9-11 um, was another one of those peaks where everyone sort of came together recognizing that there was this terrific threat out there. Um, but those always wane. And I would say we're now in a period where, you know, we're not close to one of those maximal points of cooperation. Even with that being said, are there things that both law enforcement and the intelligence community could be doing better or could do to make that cooperation, understanding that there's always going to be a natural tension, understanding that companies want legal orders that, they're, that they then comply with. But is there anything that, the, that Uncle Sam could be doing better, um, either from a PR perspective or from an engagement with industry perspective, that would make this tension maybe less acute at times? Because I wouldn't think something like the San Bernardino event is an ideal way for that to play out. So I, I would just pick up on your last point, Ted, which with respect to transparency, and and because I, I having worked again in the government and know I know that the the debate that occurs about how much information the intelligence community is willing to let out about the types of requests that that are made of companies, mm -hmm. and 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 you know with a little bit of perspective and a little bit of distance, it, it does strike me that the, the government could be and could benefit um, and without really much risk or losing much by allowing companies to be more forthcoming about the types of requests they're getting and, and, the, and how often they're responding in a way that I think would um, would actually yeah would build trust yeah. between uh, the government and the private sector and then the private sector with the you know the technology companies with their users and employees. Um, and, and, you know, look, the intelligence community is reflexively secretive, and that just comes with the territory. So sort of breaking down some of that reflexive secrecy to, uh, to think more creatively about ways in which it can be more transparent or at least allow companies to be more transparent about the way uh, companies are interacting with the government, I think would be something that is a concrete thing that could be done uh, to, uh, to enable a greater degree of, of cooperation. I agree 100% with that. And I think the aftermath of Snowden showed this. I think the Snowden revelation, or the Snowden stories, not, they not, didn't reveal anything. The Snowden, the breathless Snowden stories would have been a lot less impactful if you had had. So right now, the, now the government allows you not only to include in your overall number, we were only allowed to say we receive eight to 9,000 in the past six months, and that covers between 18 and 20,000 users. Now you go. You, now you. After my time, you can go one step further, and you can actually break out in your, your biannual report in ranges how many FISA orders, how many mm -hmm. FAA, how many you know, how many uh, NSLs, national security letters, different types of intel intelligence related requests, and the number is always very low. And I think that if if that had been in place before Snowden. You know, I, I bet even Glenn Greenwald and the others would have said, well, we, you're not showing us anything new. This is just 702 program, and Google's disclosing that it's only received between zero and 499 of these in the past year. This is not a big deal. This is not a massive pipe sucking out user data. John, any thoughts on this as a former DOJ official? 
and, and you have the benefit of, uh, you know, having no dog in the hunt in terms of being affiliated with the private sector. But yeah, I don't. <laughs> to my regret, again, as I'd like to <laughs> emphasize. Uh, so, uh, one thing I, so one thing struck me is uh, from the comments is just this gap between the workforce and corporate leadership and sort of a kind of patriotic nation state ideal. And so one thing I would suggest is uh, you see a lot of um, former government officials going to work for these companies and providing the perspective of government. And maybe it's different now. My sense when I was in the government was we had very little corporate perspective within the government. Mm -hmm. so I think one thing you could, so like I was saying here, like we've got these national security fellows from the military and government agencies at Hoover who take a year and spend a year in academia. Maybe there's a way to create a system to force engineers from these companies to come spend a year in the government and see the securities perspective from the nation's yeah. viewpoint rather than, you know, oh, you know, if you're a computer engineer, maybe you just see it from a global perspective or you have a, maybe you're, you know, just have a bias against the United States given all the bad media and so on. But if you were to see the, right, you, as you always say, like when you learn the problems and the threats of national security, your perspective completely changes, right? The president's perspective completely changes the first day he sees the, you know, the daily brief, right? Maybe that would be good and healthy for people from Silicon Valley to see on a more uh, consistent basis, but at the same time preserve the separation so that we don't want to have, you know, what we worry about with China, where our businesses are actually, you know, sort of seen by us as quasi arms of the government and can't be trusted. No American company wants to be viewed as Huawei is being viewed now by the United States. Right. So something that would enhance understanding by personnel exchanges is maybe a small thing to do. You know, ideally, I would like there to be more understanding of the government, what companies could do validly to help the national security mission, but not in a legally compulsory, mandatory way where they're forced uh, to do it. There's got to be some space for that as once existed, but, you know, we, you know, the companies are the ones who would have to explain to the government what they can do, because I think government doesn't really understand it that well. Yeah. So we've got a few minutes left. Are there <clears throat> any questions from the audience? So the answer to that is yes. I see at least three, <laughs> and they all went up uh, sort of simultaneously. So why don't we start with the gentleman here uh, sitting on the aisle, and then we'll work our way to the two folks in the middle. Hi. Uh, thank you for your um, insights. So you talked about the San Bernardino incident um, and how this process of litigation and friction between government and tech titans leads to uh, productive outcomes eventually, uh, but the process itself is very slow. And so I want you to picture a scenario where the government uh, of the United States, for example, uh, needs information on an immediate basis. Um, but because of the lack of precedent, uh, there's no way to give them information under the current regime. And so are there ways to predict scenarios where something might happen in the future, um, but the government, but there's no legal precedent for, for that scenario? And how do you sort of bypass that litigation process? Matt, do you want to try and tackle that? You were pretty close to some of those issues. The, the first thing that comes to mind is maybe not a very satisfactory answer because it, but the, in, the, in the Department of Justice and the intelligence community, when there was an emergency situation, there were provisions in the law under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act to obtain uh, emergency orders so that within really a matter of hours or even minutes, mm -hmm. you, we could get, we being the government, the government could get approval for a, an order to go out to a company to provide information so that it would be near, you know, it would be qu very quick. And, and, and the relationships with those companies that typically receive those orders were well established so that they could provide that data, um, you know, very quickly, um, you know, again, in a matter of hours. Uh, and then there would be a follow-up after the fact, sort of pr judicial process to mm -hmm. either sustain, typically would be to sustain that decision, but at least it would be reviewed by a judge. But the initial decision was within the executive branch. So that was designed as a legal process to address the scenario that, that, that you pose of a, you know, sort of a fast-paced um, emergency situation where there was an, you know, I forget exactly the standard, but it's in the statute something akin to, you know, there's a serious risk of life or bodily injury, uh, and if that standard was met and the attorney general could decide that there was still, that there was a basis, probable cause, the information could be obtained on an emergency basis. That's the first thing that comes to mind, and that's, and I think there are statistics on how often that's used, and it's, and I, and I can say from experience, it's used, you know, 
frequently. You know, it's not something that's only once or twice a year. So there's some degree of frequency of how often that emergency process is used. Yeah, and I'll just draw on my own experience, um, having done some of that work. Um, you always think, well, there may be something new that comes along that no one's thought of. The the we do have the framework in place that Matt talked about. We also have an incredibly talented group of lawyers at the Department of Justice that while they may not have seen that exact thing before, they've seen something that rhymes with it or that sounds like it before. And they're incredibly uh, skilled and incredibly mindful of that balance of, you know, making sure that the government gets the information it needs, but also making sure that we're being mindful of the Fourth Amendment and the rights of individuals. And so I've I don't remember there ever being a crisis where there wasn't a group of lawyers in a conference room very quickly trying to figure out what's the right answer and, and, and getting to that right answer. But. So we've uh, <clears throat> set a record at a Federal Society event of maybe four hours without having talked about the founders or the framers. <laughs> so I'm going to do that so that we can never let a Federal Society <laughs> event go by without uh, adulation of the people who founded the country. And so they actually worried about this and wrestled with it. And I would say the contradictions and tensions that you nicely identify are, you know, sit at the root of our constitutional system. We have not resolved it. Just to briefly describe, Jefferson was probably shared the civil liberties perspective. He was both both uh, Hamilton and Jefferson recognized there were going to be emergencies that we didn't know about, couldn't prepare for. There's no precedent because they're emergencies. By definition, we didn't know what to do yet because it hadn't happened. And so Jefferson had a really interesting view. He thought you should do what's necessary to respond to the threat and then pretend it never happened. Mm-hmm. Set no precedent. Right? He said, don't ever let anything be permanent because then you'll be able to do it more easily next time. So he said... This is what he called the prerogative. It had to do with buying Louisiana, oddly enough for him. But he said buying Louisiana, he thought his original view was you had to amend the Constitution each time we added a state to the Union, which I thought was great because then Louisiana would not be part of the Union. But for any then he said, but it's such a good deal. It's so cheap. I got to buy it. <laughs> He's an American. He can't resist a good deal. But then he said... But and as he wrote this very clear in a letter, he said, but I don't ever want what I just did to be a precedent for next time. So it's such an emergency. I acted outside the Constitution. And then he said, all I can do is ask for the public afterwards to bless what I did. Yeah. Right. Hamilton thought, no, he, he said this too clearly. The Constitution can't be so narrow that it can't have the power to respond to every kind of emergency. So he's more like... Matt's perspective, you know, Matt's, Matt, Matt's, Matt's, you know, the lawyer's perspective would be find a precedent, analogize, it, maybe expand government power to the next similar case. Um, that's Hamilton's view because he said it's a contradiction for the government not to have the power to respond to every emergency that threatens it. And we still, you know, you can hear in our debates today about the border wall and national emergency, the, the echoes of that, that fundamental two differences in how to approach this. So I don't know if there's a clear right answer because we, they didn't solve it and they wrote that difference of opinion into the Constitution, really. I think, I think we had a question from yeah, the, the, the lady in this the striped sweater. Thank you very much. Um, Professor, you, you began by giving us the, the parameters of an attack on the gov- government level and what you've been discussing a lot of the criminal activity. So the criminal one has all the conundrums, and I think that's largely because we don't have a very well-defined idea of how the data merges with my property rights, with my person. So when I'm in using Google Maps and it knows my location, it, and then it adds it with my telephone and my text and everything else, my Facebook, it gets a vision of me that is my property that, that I did not give consent for it to use in any tiny little piece, but when it amalgamates it, it gets a lot of my property, uh, and we have laws about uh, search of personal property. So that's my comment on the criminal activity. My bigger issue is with the uh, other dimension of the government being attacked. And I don't think we have a good definition of what is a cyber attack. And we also don't have a good definition of the value of what is loss. Because when there was an attack and the airline, uh, I forget which is the airline, but it was shot down over Lockerbie. We considered that an attack. And there was a retaliation. It wasn't 
a conscription of some company to retaliate, but it was the government saying, we're gonna bomb you, Libya, because you made this attack. So the government should act in that way and it should be overt about its activity because that's the only way that this becomes a retaliation that is commensurate with the attack and would forestall uh, future attacks. I think that's, a, that's the, I think, the difficulty about this new tech world. I think the Pan Am example, Lockerbie bombings, attacks on Americans, attack on American property, uh, the nation state would then decide, is it an act of war? Are we gonna respond with a certain amount of force back? And if you, you know, traditionally, if someone did attack an American, kill Americans, destroy American property, we had the ability to call it an act of war, and we've gone to war in cases where that's happened, even though they were even privately owned property or people. The, I think what I've noticed with cyber is that we don't automatically think that way. So think of the hack on Sony by North Korea. Think about the many hacks on Facebook or probably on Uber by other countries. We don't, you don't really think of us, see a lot of people saying, is that an act of war? Should the government retaliate on behalf? You know, instead you say, why should the government retaliate on behalf of Sony? You know, we sort of, and I think that's why I was saying that this deal has kind of broken down between Americans and companies and the government, because the government doesn't automatically sit there, I think, and say, is this an act of war? Should we use force in response, or a cyber attack in response to a hack of a, of a private company? That would not have been a harder, I think when they're, because it's intangible, because a lot of things you just, it's information, it's intangible, it seems almost like that's not something we would go to war or engage in an act of uh, use of force to respond with, whereas that would have been automatic when it was tangible, real world property, real people. <clears throat> I just don't think we've uh, identified our personalities with the data and there has to be a better definition of what the loss is. That's what gets at your issue. Uh, we're, we're almost at the end of our time. I've got, we've got time for one more question. Did I see another hand? Yeah, sir. So my, my question, first of all, in response to how the government can out, kind of outreach with Silicon Valley and other people too, uh, one thing I have found effective are the um, kind of public private partnerships like what the FBI does with InfraGuard, mm -hmm. and the Citizens Academy and things like that. It's a way for resident, local residents to connect with local uh, arms of the government. So it's a lo lot lower cost than trying to go work directly and some other things. I found every time that I've done something like that, the people I meet in government and in government law enforcement are there for the right reasons. They're mission driven, and I and my sense of trust always rises from that kind of interaction. So I just might suggest that as an alternative. My if you give me your name and address, I'll make sure you get an FBI mug. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like a computer program. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but my question <laughs> is this: uh, companies could, I think, if they chose to provide platforms that are extremely secure and near impenetrable, and from a practical standpoint, would be, are or would be impenetrable. In your opinions, do individuals in the United States have a right to use that kind of technology if they choose to, to where the government essentially can have the right to search with a warrant but doesn't necessarily have the ability or right to find. And I'd just like to know what your views are from the public's right to use technology that can successfully insulate public inf the private information from public law enforcement's ability to get it. Does anyone want to comment on that? I'll take a stab at it. I, 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 it in terms of rights, I don't see a right either way. I see no, I don't think the Constitution or anything would address that. Um, but I, it, I think that we're seeing this a little bit in the encryption scenario. I think it's a great policy question. I think, and I think both from a company perspective and from a national security perspective and a government, you know, law enforcement and intel community perspective, it's an interesting question. Is, is full encryption, perfect encryption, let's say it exists, is that better for the national security? 
I mean, users would have to say, well, that's great for my messages, but then what if the guy is going to come in and break into my house and then we can't figure out who did that because they did it all through this perfectly encrypted stuff. You'd have to weigh that yourself as to where you stand on that. And I think then the national security community in particular, law enforcement as well, but national security would have to say, is it better to have our infrastructure, our airports, our dams, our nuclear power plants protected by that perfect encryption if the cost of that is we can't intercept Al Qaeda messages or even know that they're communicating on it, I, I think there's reasonable views on both sides of that. And but I don't think I don't think it's rights. I think it's um, I think right now you can do, you know, if somebody makes that product, users certainly have right to use it, um, and the government would have, um, I think, unless it, it, other than invoking commerce, war they could ban it. Yeah, they could. Yeah, I guess today they with commerce clause, right? yeah, under today's commerce, clause. and and maybe the executive in yeah. maybe the executive could you know, use war powers to to, to so intercept right this, to commander in chief power to do it. Yeah, I I think that's right. Like I don't, I mean the the libertarian in me says, of course you can you buy any product and use it as you see fit. Unfortunately, <laughs> where's there, where's there, where's Richard? That's another record. Richard has been silent for three hours at a Federal Society event. <laughs> now that record is now ended. So <laughs> it seems to me that you would, but the government under current readings of the Commerce Clause has the right, I think, unfortunately, to ban any product in you know, its sale. Uh, so they could, the government could try to, to ban encryption. So I think that's how that works. In terms of the right when it came time to search, I think a company or an individual could say, I'm not going to help you break into that encryption system, and the court has the right to fine you every day that you refuse to comply with a court order. Uh, so I agree with Ted. It's not like the constitutional right, or constitutional law and rights are going to provide a resolution. Both the, the extremes of those really point out that you're going to have to have a political or uh, policy resolution of these kinds of conflicts about encryption. Matt, do you want to? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a obviously part of this encryption debate, and, and it's, a, it's a really hard policy question. I, I guess one way I look at this is, I mean, for one, the cat's out of the bag, right? There are companies now, as you, as you put it, that are impenetrable, right, that provide communication services that are basically unbreakable for, and, can, and would not be in a position to comply with a government or, order. But from, from another perspective, I mentioned earlier that I was a prosecutor, uh, and I was a prosecutor for over a decade, and, and it be sort of pre-internet. And I'm struck with all of the ways in which a, a, a prosecutor today or a law enforcement agent today has access to information that will, won't be encrypted. Um, it's by, de you know, companies can't encrypt data that they're using, metadata, for example, that they need to use for their business. Like, so y there are avenues to gain access to information that is not encrypted, that didn't exist, you know, 20 years ago. So there's, as much as there may be pockets of darkness, uh, there are areas of light increasing. So I, I think there's a way out of this conundrum by thinking about all the ways in which the government can get access to information it needs to investigate a crime or to, to protect our national security without really confronting the hard problem of would we ever ban encryption? Again, uh, uh, something that's kind of too late anyway, uh, given the number of countries around the, companies around the world that are providing that kind of service. So I, I think there's a hopeful answer here to avoid this, you know, inevitable, you know, conflict uh, where there's a sort of a win-win in the works. Well, and with that, Matt Olson has ended the panel in the perfect way, which is talking about the bright light poking through pockets of darkness and leaving us with a sense of optimism as we hopefully um, go across the hall and enjoy what I would guess is some nice California wine and possibly some chunks of cheese. But before we do that, if you could join me in thanking the panel, thanking Hoover, thanking the Federalist Society and National Security Institute. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>